I'm Tanya Iser, investigative reporter here at Channel 8. I'm joined by Jason Whiteley. Uh, Jason, we're watching this courtroom. There's been quite a bit of activity. Uh, all the lawyers have returned to the courtroom. Uh, we have not yet seen the judge. Uh, the, there's a court reporter in there. We know that the uh, jury asked two questions this morning. They wanted to know the definitions of the Castle Doctrine and manslaughter, and they also asked for an exhibit. Yeah, and the big question right now is, have they reached a verdict or is there something else going on? And usually, you know, covering as many cases as you have and as I have too between Dallas and Houston, um, usually we know if there is a verdict that has been reached. The, the red light goes on, and it has gone on earlier today as they had questions. Yeah. But usually at this point, we know whether a verdict has been reached. And also, there's a, usually a delay as well, too, uh, where the judge gives all the parties a chance to get back to the courthouse and back into the courtroom. And you see Amber Geiger, she is in the courtroom as well, sitting in the far right of your screen, just below that uh, black laptop there next to her attorney, Toby Shook. And Judge Kemp is walking in as well. We should hear more right, we'll right now. You all may be seated. <clears throat> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Uh, the jury having reached a verdict, uh, Ms. Geiger and your team, would you please stand? We, the jury, unanimously find the defendant, Amber Geiger, guilty of murder as charged in the indictment. No outburst and it is signed by the presiding juror, who is juror number 11. Mr. Rogers, would you like to have the jury poll? There you go. All right. You may be seated, Ms. Geiger. Uh, we're gonna take a break. Um, you all will have a long lunch break today, and we will resume court at 1 p.m. Okay? All right.
Wow, his mom and dad. There were audible gasps. Have we seen Have we seen Amber Geiger be escorted out of here yet? Or? No, not yet. Not, not, not yet. The, the penalty so, for, for murder is five to ninety nine. So the minimum that she would face is uh, is five years. Uh, she's sitting there facing forward. We've not yet seen, at least from where we're sitting here, there, our vantage point, any reaction from her yet. Yeah, there's a little commotion in the courtroom as that sheriff's deputy is standing guard over uh, Toby Shook, her defense attorney, and, and Amber Geiger there. So what's going to happen next here is the judge said they're going to have an extended lunch break. Um, th this was, the jury deliberated for what, six, seven hours before they well, they, they deliberated about four hours yesterday, and it would have been about two hours today. So about, about six, six hours. hours. It, it's and, and she's crying and now. She's, you can see it's starting to see a reaction. Yeah. Um, and and now what will happen is what's called the punishment phase. We will hear testimony from uh, presumably from both of Jean's mother and probably other family members, people who will talk about his life, and and there'll be that kind of testimony. And then there'll be testimony probably from character witnesses, presumably from her family members. That'll probably go a day, maybe two days, and then this jury will be, th this jury that has now found her guilty of murder will be the ones deciding her fate. Uh, you can see Amber Geiger, very emotional. Um, at, at, the in, <clears throat> at the end of the day, let me clear my throat here. At the end of the day, I, I, think, I think the prosecution was able to clearly enunciate that she had options when she walked in that apartment. She is a trained professional, she had options, and she did not go by the training she got from the uh, police academy. She did not retreat to a safe place. She did not call for backup. Instead, what happened here is she went straight in. And from my understanding, Tanya, you watched a lot more testimony than I did, but she never saw a weapon. She no. just saw a figure and she opened fire. And that was pretty clear, I think, in the prosecution's uh, case when they presented that. Yeah, what she said was that when she went in, she saw a silhouette and she said, let me see your hands, let me see your hands. And her description was that uh, he was coming at her. The prosecution's contention was that he had, he had shorts on that had no pockets and that she acted unreasonably, that she could have not gone on into that apartment, that she could have, you know, shut that door behind them and ended this situation. And then if she'd have slowed it down, she could have looked down and saw that red mat that we heard so much about. Which was on his doormat and uh, not on hers. And, and what's striking about this is that Toby Shook is her defense attorney who was sitting next to her there. A very experienced, very good attorney here in Dallas, a former uh, prosecutor, first assistant there at the uh, Dallas County DA's office. But for whatever reason, his defense did not connect with jurors in this case. The fact that they found her guilty so quickly is, is astonishing considering how much they had to consider in this. They had a manslaughter charge to consider, a mistake of fact, uh, um, the murder charge as well too, and it sounds like they had their minds made up pretty quickly uh, going in here too. Yeah, we've got Judge, Ro Judge Rob Conyus has just walked in. I'm going to trade out microphones and let him sit here and give a little more context on what we're seeing. The legal expert as we've been trying to <laughs> parse through this verdict. Uh, this is a, Let's trade a, out here with the judge. It's a pretty, it was a lot of question, you know, this morning when we heard the jurors ask the question about manslaughter, the Castle Doctrine. You know, there's no way to know when a jury is deliberating what they're really looking at. It could have just been that they were working their way through the definitions. But again, a, a, a stunning decision. They have come back fairly quickly. We had thought that they might deliberate for a day or two days, but they have come back with their decision and they have found... Amber Geiger, guilty of murder, Judge. Wow. Well, that's, uh, I mean, uh, it's not, uh, it I knew that the prosecution had a hard road to go down, um, but obviously they made their case to the satisfaction of the jury. Um, I know that they had some questions earlier this morning, uh, and it's not surprising. I mean, the, the, um, the uh, charge was very complex. Uh, so for them to have some legal questions, especially about the Castle Doctrine uh, and manslaughter and how it all works together, it's not surprising. Uh, this jury was made up of eight women and four men. Do you think the makeup of the jury would have played any role here? You know, I don't know. Uh, I, well, I definitely think the makeup of the jury uh, does play a role. I don't know if gender by itself uh, has how much that would have much to do with it, but certainly um, the, all the factors that make up uh, the jury, you know, it's, it seems like they were fairly representative of Dallas County. 
Um, but uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, I was curious yesterday about what their work status was, you know, uh, education degree level kind of thing like that. Uh, all of those factors do play in. Where do you think, what do you think connected with the jury? I mean, what, what, where, what of the prosecution's arguments connected? Well, I think, number one, that this was an innocent man in his own home. Uh, you know, it's hard to, if, if, if you were truly like these jurors said they were and didn't have a lot of exposure to this case, you know, that, that headline, so to say, you know, would be pretty shocking to them, I think. Um, the, so just that fact. But I think um, they, they must not have believed her uh, story completely about uh, her thinking it was her apartment or they believed that that's was that must have been something that it wasn't reasonable to really think that you're gonna miss all these clues walk in and then you know automatically assume that that the person there is there to do you harm uh, and pull out your gun uh, you know and maybe they did assume that all those things could have been reasonable to, up to the point where she got through the door but they must have really latched on to the prosecution's argument that once she got to that door, she had, she had options. other options, and she should have taken those options. Because she wasn't fully in the apartment. Right, right. And she wasn't fully in the apartment when she, I think by her own testimony, even began to hear uh, sounds and voices inside, or a voice inside, some sounds coming from inside. Um, so at that point, she should have taken other steps, uh, called back up, what have you. How much do you think her, her training would have played a part in this jury's decision? I think, I think obviously if they went guilty, they must have thought that she's not like you and me. You know, she's got other resources. Other, she's been through the scenario many times, even if it's just in a training situation. You know, she has, she, she has the ability, or at least she should have had the ability to overcome that initial fear or anxiety that you have when your adrenaline run, is running and you go from zero to 10 as the lawyers were putting it. So the lawyers must have thought her training makes her different than me and you. And that's what essentially the prosecution was arguing as well. So walk our, our viewers through what's coming next. What, what, what's the process now that she's been found guilty? What can they expect? So now that she's been found guilty, what's gonna happen next is we move into the punishment phase. Whether we do that this afternoon, which I would fully expect. It sounds like it. They've, she's told the jury to be back at one o'clock. Yeah, so they're gonna begin hearing punishment evidence. So this will be the stage of the trial where both sides get to present. They can present basically the facts of the case over again, not in any great depth, but just to remind the jury about how shocking this case was, how unnecessary it was, uh, focus on Mr. Jean and his life and the loss of his family. You could expect maybe another family member, maybe a sister again to testify as to the family's loss. But you're also going to hear that most likely from Ms. Geiger's side. This is her chance, her family's chance to also speak out and say, this isn't really my daughter, this isn't really my sister, you know, have mercy on her. Um, so we know she can't get probation, so I'm, I'm assuming that the, the defense will be asking for a very, very low prison time. Minimum of five. As minimum of five, but somewhere in that lower range. Do they take her into custody awaiting the sentencing phase? Most likely they will, you know, if we don't get a punishment verdict today, most likely the judge will take her into custody until she can file that appellate bond. It, it, you know, it's all dependent on, it's all dependent on the sentence that she actually gets. If she gets 10 years or less, then she can ap ap appeal to the judge to give her a bond so she can be out of jail while her appeal is waiting, assuming she's gonna appeal it, which I would expect she would. If it's uh, 11 years or more, then she's not applicable to apply for that, and she'll have to be in prison while her appeal is pending. What do you think the, the, the defense failed here? Well, um, you know, I think uh, the def obviously the, defend the defense uh, didn't counter strongly enough that her training uh, wasn't a factor here or shouldn't have been considered a factor here. Um, that at that time she was more like me and you and not like a trained officer. Um, they, uh, you know, I, I, I remember commenting when she testified that I didn't think she was as descriptive as she could have been. Uh, she could have been 
um, she could have relayed to the jury more of what really her day felt like from her own point of view, what, you know, just to give her, the jury some perspective of what she was going through on that day. Would have it made a difference, I'm not sure at this point, but, but the de I think the defense could have been a little clearer, a little more forceful with their story. Are you surprised by how quickly this decision came back? A little bit, a little bit, yeah. It's uh, the... Um, Hold on a second, we're about to okay. be, they're about to take us live oh, on TV, okay. so we're going to reset. I'm Tanya Iser with Channel 8. I'm here joined by Rob Conyas, a, a former judge. We are just, have within the last few minutes, heard the decision that Amber Geiger has been found guilty by this jury of eight women and four men guilty of murder. Judge Conyas, what's your reaction to this verdict? Well, uh, I, I, I've always thought that the prosecution had the hardest road to go down. So I'm, I am, I'm, I'm not going to lie and say I'm not a little surprised that they, that they achieved it because they did have the harder burden to prove. Um, I, I, I probably would have been less surprised if it was the manslaughter verdict. But uh, obviously uh, the prosecution's uh, version of the facts resonated with the jury. Uh, they must have thought that she had uh, uh, must she had options other than going through the door, pulling out her gun, and shooting Mr. Jean. And, and they clearly rejected mistake of fact. Yes, and so and, be, and probably we were just talking about how maybe her training uh, might have might have hurt her in this situation because she's not like me and she's not like you. She's got she's practiced this scenario with uh, other police officers. She's been trained, drilled, literally drilled on what to do when you encounter intruders, uh, whereas me and you, we're going to have to work it out for ourselves. And so maybe the jury wasn't giving her the benefit of the doubt that me or you might have gotten in, in the similar situation. And they just didn't buy that a man who's sitting on his couch eating a bowl of ice cream is yeah, a threat. Yeah, I mean, uh, if these jurors are like they said that they were, that they hadn't really been overly exposed to this story, that just that scenario might have been kind of shocking to a few of them that we're talking about a man who was eating ice cream in his own house and a few seconds later he's dead you know that that's that that could be shocking to them and so um, uh, I could see where uh, that uh, that initial sh well that shock it, what might have might have been in their mind during the whole case and and uh, I don't want colored their view of the evidence. I'm not trying to say that negatively, it's just the way their frame of mind was going through the going through the case. Well, after this verdict, we saw tears of joy and a lot of hugging from both of John's family. Uh, we also saw tears from Amber Geiger. She is just now leaving the courtroom. Uh, she had a, a good defense team. I mean, these are well-respected attorneys. Where, where did they what were their mistakes in this case? Well, they are very well-respected attorneys. Uh, I know Toby and Robert both, and several of the other lawyers on her team, as I know the uh, uh, Jason Hermes. Um, you know, I think uh, I kind of commented on it when we were watching her testify, that I really felt like she needed to hit a home run, because this case was going to come down to her testimony. Didn't. She didn't really hit a home run. Where'd she fail? You know, I think she could have been much more descriptive. Uh, could have done a better job of trying to put the jury in her shoes because that's what the charge of the court from the judge said when you're viewing this evidence you have to view it from her perspective as a trained police officer so she probably could have been more descriptive done a better job of saying this is who I am this is how I see things this is what I was feeling that day and this is why I did what I did Wow, it's a. It, and it, are you surprised at how quickly this verdict came out? Also, we're seeing that's her mother and either her father or stepfather, her family members also reacting to this verdict. Yeah. Were you surprised though by how quickly this verdict came back? I, a, a little bit, yes, especially this morning, because I felt like if they didn't make, if they didn't come to a verdict yesterday afternoon, then uh, the, what I was taking from that was that neither side's message just immediately cut through all the things that they had to consider. So neither side had that, the clear, clear message. So I figured, well, if they didn't come back yesterday, they're gonna really dig in and spend some time today. 
Uh, I don't know exactly when they informed the judge that the verdict had come through. Um, I know it's uh, probably, they've only been deliberating for what, two and a half hours max this morning, so. They came back in at 8.30, so okay. it was two hours at, at the most and four hours yesterday, so six hours total yeah, for so them to work their way through a fairly complicated jury charge. Yeah. I mean, it seems like they pretty quickly came to a decision, we don't buy her story. Right, I think that's probably right. And so, uh, so I am a little, I, I expected them to deliberate a little longer considering the complexity and the issues they had to go through. There are questions this morning. They asked for the definitions of manslaughter and the Castle Doctrine, and they asked for an exhibit, although we don't know what that exhibit was. Any any thoughts on what why they would have asked that question? Well, my first when I heard that, my first inkling was that, okay, so there's at least some people back there who are open to the idea of mistake of fact, because you don't get to the Castle Doctrine um, without the 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 premise of mistake of fact you don't even get there so that was telling me that there are at least some people back on the jury who are at least open to the idea um, and um, the castle doctrine also probably take that another step further because if they had questions about it granted it's a complicated piece of the law but if they had questions about it it meant that at least there were some people who were open to seeing how that would apply in these facts. And then a, coupled with manslaughter made me think, okay, maybe there's a, a good number of jurors back there who are, going, who are not going to go murder, they're going to go in a different direction. Um, often what happens sometimes when you get a question like that and the judge gives a response like Judge Kemp rightly did in this case, I can't tell you more than what I've already told you. Um, jurors will probably go back and say, well, okay then, then um, uh, not to say that they need to move on, but we've the judge has given us what we need. Let's just look to this document one more time, take a vote, and, and the verdict comes. It seems like the prosecution did a pretty good job of painting her as unlikable with the, all this, these issues of sexting with her partner and just, you think, mm -hmm. how, how, what were your thoughts on that? Well, I think, I, I think if, it, if they didn't like her, that was one way to uh, begin to not trust her or not to take her at her her version as the way that they ought to go. You know, I, I often think that jurors are looking for one side or the other to uh, to say, okay, you're you're the team that I, I can trust you. I, you're helping me through this process. Your version of the facts sounds more reasonable than the other sides. But if they don't like you or, you know, that could begin to break that down and, or prevent it from being established in the first place. Okay, we have Rebecca Lopez on the phone. Rebecca, are you there? Uh, yeah, I'm actually here with our live picture. You can see our camera here. We're waiting for the family to come out of the courtroom and their lawyers to come out and, and speak. Um, as we've been reporting, as soon as the verdict was read, and uh, both of John's mom threw up her hands. There were cheers that went out across this courthouse from supporters of uh, both um, John's family. Okay, now you see that there are security guards. There's fire marshals here. They're trying to clear the media out of these uh, area where the family is expected to come and, and talk, but there is a lot of security here. There's, there's uh, hundreds of press here from all over the country. Uh, they're trying to get us to move back, but there, there's just a ton, a ton of people, and we're waiting for them to come out and speak to us. Um, a little while ago, you could see where they had a flag that they were waving, and it was a flag from St. Lucia. That is um, Botham Jean's home country, uh, where he came here uh, from. He, uh, his family flew in uh, about a week ago to uh, be here for the um, for the trial. Uh, we're waiting for the parents again to come out, and also the attorneys who have basically been the spokesperson for the the family since right now they cannot talk the both parents and some other family members are witnesses in the punishment phase uh, they they have been on the witness list for quite some time there is still a gag order on the witnesses so we're not sure if we're actually going to get any reaction from both them John's parents 
but we are expecting their attorneys to come out. I think that uh, there are a lot of people, even the attorneys for both and John's family, that were thinking this was going to come down to manslaughter. So I, I do believe that this verdict took them by surprise. Uh, it took a lot of people here by surprise that she was, in fact, convicted of, of murder. And as you mentioned, she now faces 99 years in prison, up to 99 years in prison. Uh, we're also going to see if there's any reaction from um, Amber Geiger's uh, family and from prosecutors about this case. I think prosecutors were hoping that um, that their defense, uh, rather defense lawyers, uh, would come out and talk. We're also hoping that the prosecution will eventually come out and talk, but probably not at this stage because there's still a second phase of this trial that they have to go through, and that is the sentencing, which starts always in Texas, always immediately after uh, a guilty verdict is rendered. They start the, uh, the punishment phase. Uh, that's where we are right now. There are a lot of security guards uh, around. There have been people in this trial that have received death threats um, on both sides, and so the security is very tight around the families, around Amber Geiger's family, around the lawyers, around even um, the Dallas Police Association President Mike Mata, who has taken a lot of heat during this trial. So there, uh, there's a lot of security across the city right now. Um, Dallas Police uh, has two command posts set up across the city, um, so we'll see, um, you know, what the reaction is the, from the community. and. Uh, we saw earlier that they were yelling and yelling and hooting and hollering um, like um, it was victory for them, for the activists and the people have always wanted Amber Geiger actually convicted of murder. Telling us that they're trying to clear this area, but there are hundreds of media, print, TV, uh, trying to get the media to move out of the way, but no one's really budging too much. Yeah. That's what's happening here at the courthouse right now. That way. Leave, leave it to where people can walk through here. If you have all these poles hanging out, they're going to trip and fall. We have people trying to get to these courts, please, okay? So there's other uh, things happening at the courthouse. Obviously, there's other trials. This is, uh, you know, <coughs> so that's what's happening. They're trying to get the media to clear out, at least give a pathway so that people who are um, coming in and out of the courthouse to do business can, can continue to do business. So that's what's happening here. Um, trying to get the media in line while we wait for everyone else to come out and talk. Hey, Rebecca, I'm not sure if you can hear me. I know it's loud and there's a lot going on. This is Kara. I was just curious if you had seen anyone. Um, yeah, I'm looking at video right now in the courtroom of Amber Geiger's family um, sitting there, obviously pretty emotional. Um, have you seen anyone come out of that area um, who was uh, supportive of Amber Geiger? I know you've seen a lot of people supportive of both and John. Not one person. We've seen Amber Geiger's mom and her stepfather throughout the trial. They've been walking back and forth, um, you know, during going in and, and out of breaks. And we've seen them here throughout the trial. But no one from Amber Geiger's family has uh, has come out. Um, they have been taking Amber Geiger through a separate entrance. Typically, the uh, defendant uh, comes out uh, through the courthouse and through the normal means that everybody else goes through. But again, there have been uh, multiple death threats against Amber Geiger, uh, and uh, so they have been concerned about um, you know, her safety as well as the, the family and other people surrounding this trial. So they have been taking Amber Geiger out a different area, and I, I believe that maybe that's probably what they're going to do with her family at this point. I, I don't suspect that they're going to come through this horde of media, that they do have ways that they would get this, the, her family out of the courthouse so that they don't have to face um, all of this that's, um, that's out here right now. Uh, but I do suspect that uh, that we will be seeing the lawyers for both of John's family come out. They're really about the only ones that can talk. Prosecutors still can't talk. Defense attorneys can't talk. The witnesses that are going to be called in the punishment phase can't talk. So I wouldn't suspect that we're going to hear from a whole lot of people at this phase. We will not hear from everybody until the punishment phase uh, is over and they decide how many years Amber Geiger is going to spend in prison. Well, for people who are just joining us right now, we are um, live this moment uh, talking to Rebecca Lopez, who is at uh, the courthouse after Amber Geiger was found guilty of murder about 20 minutes ago. Um, and we are in midday right now 
now. We're going to keep with this story, obviously. And uh, Rebecca, we, we've been hearing from our legal um, expert uh, over at our um, Young Street uh, location talking to Tanya Iser. And a lot of folks seem to be pretty surprised that this jury came back uh, so quickly. Uh, did it catch people off guard? Did it seem to catch people off guard there at the courthouse? Um, I'm not really sure if you can speak to perhaps how people are feeling, but just kind of the, uh, the commotion that was going on before all of this. Yeah, absolutely. It caught everybody off guard because the jury had just sent out a question maybe a few minutes before asking for an exhibit. So they were wanting to see another exhibit. They just sent out two questions about the definition of manslaughter and the Castle Doctrine. Uh, Amber Geiger's lawyer, or I read both of Sean's uh, family lawyers came out and they talked about that. And so they said, you know, this is not going to be a, a quick verdict. They were, everybody was expecting that this jury was going to deliberate a lot longer. They brought up other cases of um, in the Jordan Edwards case where Roy Oliver, a police officer uh, out of uh, Balt Springs, had um, had shot a, a, an innocent teenager and he was found guilty of murder. It took that jury 15 or so hours to render that guilty verdict. So both of John's uh, family lawyers were saying, you know, we expect this to take a while. We were just all sitting around. Typically what happens is a red light goes off in the courtroom and then we know, okay, there's a verdict and they give everybody time to come down and prepare for the verdict, but none of that happened. The red light didn't go off. All of a sudden, we started seeing sheriff's deputies go into the courtroom and uh, a lot of them. And we had a producer that was sitting outside. And he was like, Rebecca, something's going on because there's a lot, a lot of deputies going into the courtroom. And that's typically what happens. And they Rebecca, the entrance and high, high profile. Not cases. to interrupt, not to interrupt you real quick, but it looks like Amber's fa Amber Geiger's family is being escorted out. Do you see anything down there? Or are they taking them out a different way like you suspected? Uh, you know, I don't see them from this point of view. Uh, Y'all are probably seeing them. Um, sometimes they take them into a little room. Okay. Uh, I will tell you that there are Dallas uh, police criminal intelligence uh, officers here. There's uh, that would usually do like protection service and stuff like that. So they may be trying to escort them out that way. Uh, they're trying to clear the area, I've, you know, the deputies, so I suspect that maybe they will be leaving the courthouse under a uh, police escort. And, and, and Rebecca, I'm sorry to circle back with you. You were saying that there was sort of a flurry of activity and all of a sudden there were sheriff's deputies around, so obviously that alerted you all to, hey, something's going on. Yeah, so there was all these deputies that came into the uh, courtroom and then we started hearing there might be a verdict and the first person that uh, tweeted out that there was a verdict was the one of both of John's uh, lawyer family lawyers and that was Lee Merritt who is um, civil rights attorney here in Dallas and he tweeted out there's a verdict uh, and then we saw both of John's family uh, come down her, the parents uh, come through the security checkpoint here and that everybody just started rushing into the courtroom uh, and uh, and then you know the, they read the verdict and it, it, it caught everyone honestly by surprise and if you talk to people around the courthouse they are surprised this jury uh, went through that jury charge pretty quickly and that this verdict came down as fast as it did I, I think that people were expecting this jury to deliberate a lot longer but they had a lot to consider but they obviously uh, rejected the defense's uh, arguments that this was a mistake of fact and that Amber Geiger should get off because she mistakenly thought she was in her apartment. They said she intentionally pulled that trigger and with that intent, she is convicted of murder. And um, I I'm just getting I'm just getting some more information, but before we talk uh, about that and about the statement regarding um, that's going to be coming from both of John's family, we're going to get to DeMond, who I believe is also in the courtroom. Okay, so we're going to go to him right now. Hey, DeMond. Hey, this Hey, Demond, it's Kara. Hey, guys. Right now, I'm with Bridget Brown. She's one of the community members who've been. Hey, Kara. I'm one of the, with one of the community members who've been watching this trial all week long. This is Bridget Brown right here. Bridget, you were in the courtroom when the verdict was read this morning. Uh, what was your immediate reaction? I was so thankful. I just, I immediately said, "Thank you, Lord," because we've been praying for justice for both of them, John. Do you have any personal connection to the family? No, I just became close with them throughout the process, throughout the trial. Now I've seen you here in the courthouse all week long. How tough has it been watching this unfold? Uh, it's been very emotional and nerve-wracking as well. And I, I, we've lost a lot of sleep. I, I could barely sleep each night thinking about and wondering what the jurors were going to decide.
side. There's been so much evidence unfolded during this trial. I know it's been kind of eye-raising for yes. a lot of community members. Yes. Did you have any doubt that the jury would make this decision, Bridget? Well, we were unsure because they did have several options to choose from. They, had, they were able to choose from manslaughter, murder, or not guilty. So we were concerned because we just never know how jurors will go on things. And Bridget, from your perspective, what was the toughest part of watching this trial? Really knowing the outcome and what the verdict would be because we've just been praying for justice for both them, Sean. What message does this send to the community members? I think we can have hope now. I think we, if, I think we can see progress going forward now. You've been with the family all week. You've been praying with them. Yes. How do you think they're doing in this moment right now? Oh my gosh, they're very emotional right now, just as I am. Just so happy. You know, we're so filled with joy right now. You look like you're still shaking a little bit, yes, Bridget. I'm just so happy and excited and thankful to God. Were you nervous that the jury wouldn't come with this decision? We just weren't sure. Again, we never know how jurors are going to go with, with things, what direction they're going to take things. And as we wrap this up, do you have any message for community members right now? I know that in a few, the jury is going to be back inside the courtroom. All sides are going to be back because the sentencing phase will start. We want the community to keep in mind as well. We still continue to watch this play out. Yes, we will be continue to watch, and we just still praying that she'll be served justice in regarding the sentencing as well. And Bridget, one thing that I did notice all week, you've been coming here every day wearing the color red. Yes, yes, watch the family that. decided that we wanted to all come in solidarity and wear red. Yeah, and you know, you guys, I've been seeing so many community members wearing red all week, standing in solidarity with uh, both of John's family. Uh, it's a lot of chaos in the courthouse right now. A lot of people just trying to witness this moment and wait to see what happens next. Uh, again, this is Bridget Brown here, and she represents the sounds that we've been hearing from a lot of community members up here right now. Okay, the demand. thanks so much. We appreciate it. Yeah, we know a lot's happening right now. If you are just joining us for midday, we are covering the Amber Geiger murder trial. She was just found guilty about 30 minutes ago of murder, and now there's going to be an extended break until 1 o'clock, a recess, and the jury will come back, and they will start the sentencing phase. Amber Geiger faces 5 to 99 years in prison because of this conviction. Now, we've been getting reaction, as you just saw, from demand, and we've been hearing from Rebecca Lopez, but we do want to read you a statement that was provided to us from a Attorney Ben Crump. This coming in, he is the personal injury and civil attorney to the family of Botham John today. He issued this statement regarding that guilty verdict, and here's what it says. Nothing will bring Botham back, but today his family has found some measure of justice. What happened on September 6, 2018 is clear to everyone. The officer saw a black man and shot without reason and without justification. I'm getting word now that the defense attorney is coming out. We're going to go t listen to that right now. This is Amber Geiger's defense attorney. Is that correct? Well, all right, know, I apologize. He just passed. He's not speaking. Uh, we'll go back out to Rebecca Lopez. So obviously, Rebecca, there's a flurry of activity going on. We're waiting for someone to come and talk, um, which is why people, I think, are, are getting anxious to hear from, from both sides. Yes, Robert Rogers, um, the main uh, defense attorney for Amber Geiger, just came out and we tried asking the questions. And of course, as I've been reporting, there is a gag order still on the lawyers until the punishment phase is is over and done with. And so we're waiting for for them to uh, to eventually talk. But that will not happen until the um, the punishment phase is over. And um, Amber Geiger, by the way, um, will be taken into custody. Uh, typically, what happens is once they are found guilty. Of, of a crime, they are then come in in handcuffs. I, I recall that uh, in other cases they do um, put them in the uh, prison jumpsuits. I don't know that that's going to happen uh, p particularly, but she will definitely come out. Um, there is uh, Dominique Alexander, who is a community activist, and I guess he's going to say something, so let's hear what he has to say. I, I don't want to assume that I speak on the behalf of this family, but as a community leader who have been fighting continuously towards police corruption in Dallas, I know I speak for our community who has labored, who has set incarcerated, who has marched the streets who has sacrificed so much for this movement yeah. to the Dallas Nine, 
to all of the people who are here, I want to say thank you. Yeah. Because of your sacrifice, this family is able to see some form of justice in Dallas, yes. Texas, yes. where many people at large in the community felt like it was hopeless. Yes. Yes. I'm so grateful to God that we see a, a guilty verdict. But the work, but the work is, my name is Minister Dominique Alexander, president of the Next Generation Action Network. Yes. The, the work is not done yet, y'all. Because one of the things that we saw in this trial with Amber Geiger is that Amber Geiger wasn't the only thing that stood trial. It was the Dallas Police Department. Yes. We saw corruption loud and clear. Yes. We saw the failures of the police department. Yes. We saw the failures of lack of policies, lack of accountability to the highest level. Yes. I thought at this time that we would be walking into DPD headquarters filing a complaint against the Dallas Police Association President Michael Mata. But we got something so great. Thank you. Because of the community work, because of what the sacrifices of all of our ancestors and people who yeah, fought on the streets right. in the 80s that's after right. the shooting death of Santos Rodriguez, Etta Collins, we now have on the day that the new ordinance of the Office of Police Civilian Oversight, we now have a guilty verdict of a yeah. Dallas police yeah. officer yeah. in the city of Dallas. We have a form of justice. Yes. We have where communities can now have a voice, yes. now can have their complaints listened to. And guess what? Let me say this. My comments is not against the men or the woman in the badge. My comments is against the culture of policing in America. The culture of policing is why we have to get to this moment. But I tell you, our community is overwhelmed with joy, happiness, and over overwhelmingly, we're going to celebrate tonight on this courthouse steps at 630. Tonight, we're going to celebrate justice. And we're going to also say that it's not over. It's not over. It's not over. Dominic, did you expect the murder conviction? What are you committed to doing next? Murder, uh, murder murder next? Murder what are you committed to doing next? We, we're committed to fighting justice. But the family, the family. John's family and lawyers, we've got to switch around, you guys. The family is about to talk. We're going to uh, walk through this media frenzy to try and get over. The family uh, came over to the other side, so I'm working my way through the hordes of media to try and get a shot of the family and hear what they have to say. Uh, Come on, one guys. Moment, you guys, um, this yeah. is quite uh, a ch challenge. Excuse me. Excuse me. Family is here, the lawyer. Okay. Hold on, guys. Hold on, guys. Let's just back up a little bit. Okay, okay let's. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna reach around there. Okay. 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 Get them yeah, they're yeah. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming out. Lee Merritt, uh, one of the family attorneys, along with brother Ben Crump, and Mr. Darrell Washington. Uh, shortly, going to hear from the family, and, and they just want to thank this community. They want to thank the people of Dallas County. Uh, they want to thank this jury uh, for taking their time, hearing the evidence, and getting it right. Uh, we still have the sentencing phase to go, but this is a huge victory, not only for the family of both Jean, but as, as his mother, Allison, told me a moment ago, this is a, a victory for black people in America. Uh, it's, it's a signal that the, the tide is going to change here. Police officers are going to begin to be held accountable for their actions, and we believe that that will begin to change policing culture all over the world. It's, it's a sad reality that this community waited on pins and needles to decide whether or not someone could be held guilty for killing an unarmed black man 
in his home while eating ice cream. This should have been automatic. This should have been anticipated and expected, but it is extremely rare. And we, from this day forward, we are making it, we're, we're leading the way we are pushing so that it is not rare, but that this is common, that justice uh, continues to roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Yeah. We, we said it all along, when Tobias Mackey was killed, no one thought it was a problem. When James Harper was killed, nobody thought it was a problem. Clinton Allen was killed. We still didn't believe when we said we had training issues within the Dallas Police Department. It took us losing someone like Botham for Dallas, this entire state and the whole world to finally hear what we've been saying all along. There are serious issues within the Dallas Police Department and training issues. We were here just a few months ago when Ra Oliver was convicted for the murder of Jordan Edwards. And now we're here today because Amber Geiger has now been convicted of murder for the death of Botham. And we just hope that somehow, some way, we can get some healing in this community and we can get the proper training so no other family can have to deal with what Bertram and Ms. Allison, Alicia and Brent are now dealing with. Although we got a murder conviction, their lives will never be the same ever again. But we just hope that now people who live in the South Side Flats, people who live in houses who, that look identical, this ruling will now say that you are safe to be in your homes and people can no longer just say, I made a mistake and took your life. I am attorney Ben Crump along with attorney Darrell Washington and attorney Lee Merritt. Brothers, I'm so very honored to be in the foxhole. We're fighting for justice for this great family of Botham Jones and to make history today in America. To make history today in America. Absolutely. You know, Botham Jones was a near perfect person of color. So this jury had to make history in America today because Botham was the best that we had to offer a 26-year-old, college-educated black man, certified public accountant, working for one of the big three accounting firms in the world, Price Waterhouse Cooper. But it shouldn't take all of that for unarmed black and brown people in America to get justice. Like Attorney Merritt and Attorney Washington said, this is a precedence now that will go forth across America for equal justice under the law for everybody, whether you black, white, red, brown, it doesn't matter. And this verdict is for Trayvon Martin, it's for Michael Brown, it's for Sandra Bland, it's for Tamir Rice, it's for Eric Gardner, it's for Antoine Rose, yes. Jamel Robeson. for Jamel Robes, for E.J. Bradford, for yes. Stephon Clark, for, for Jeffrey Dennis, Jeffrey Dennis Genevieve's Dawes, Genevieve's Dawes for Pamela Turner, oh, for hilarious. so many unarmed black and OJ brown Ferry. human beings mm -hmm. all across America. Yes. This verdict today is for them. Yes. Everybody can raise their hand. Yes. This verdict is for them. Yes. This verdict is for them. Yes. I, I just had the district attorney's office tap me on my shoulder, and because the sentencing phase is coming up where the family will testify, they've asked that I withhold their statements. I, I, I do want to relay what this family has always stood on, and it's their faith in God, and it's their belief in, in, in Christ Jesus. And it was both of those faith that we believe played a key factor in that. And because of that, I'm going to ask both of those pastor, Pastor Barry, to come forward and give a statement. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I, I'd just like to say that on behalf of the, uh, the faith community uh, here in Dallas, in the state of Texas, and also here in the U.S., um, and on behalf of the uh, Dallas area preachers and church leaders, this, this verdict is exactly what we were looking for. I want to say thank you to the, uh, the jurors for being willing uh, to make that, that tough decision. I want to say thank you to the, the prosecutors for the, for the excellent job that they did. And now we're just going to move forward and continue to uh, respond in the appropriate way uh, going forward. But we just want to say, and, and the other thing that I want to say is that uh, this also lets us know that the God that we serve is still on the throne. That's right. Yeah. 
God yes. is, is still in control. Amen. And, and Amen. he has been uh, all along. I, I have some other of my uh, associates with me, Jonathan Morrison, and also Colin Packer. I'd like for them to have, have comments. We believe in the wisdom of this jury that that decision is in the hands of this jury. Uh, and so I'm, uh, uh, we believe that Botham's life mattered and we want to see a sentence that reflects that. Yeah. And many people, a lot of uh, commentators said there would be no murder conviction. Right. So right now we're already ahead of the game and we welcome the jury's decision as uh, Attorney Merritt and Attorney Washington have said. What, do you, what we do know though is that Amber Geiger got on the stand and she testified without a doubt that she intended to kill both of them. And we just hope that the jury remembers that this is an individual that says she didn't make a mistake, she intended to kill, and we think that the sentence that they give her should, should be reflect a, that. Should reflect you that. all know what? Imagine what the sentence would be if the roles were reversed and both of Joan killed Amber Geiger. Why can't it be equal justice in America, That's right. no matter what the ethnicity of the murderer is? And two days, two days after she killed both of them, she was back sexting wow. and talking about getting drunk. So this is a person that has no remorse. This is a person being in jail for five to six years will not be enough. So we want the sentence to definitely reflect that. Do you worry what about an appeal? What your sense of hearing the concept of mistake of fact and castle doctrine? Well, here's what we know, and I'll let Lee talk, but here's what we know. We did not think mistake of fact and the castle doctrine should have gotten in there, but what the family know today and what we feel comfortable about, there's really nothing that the defense going to be able to appeal. They got everything that they wanted. So, and they did not get the verdict that they wanted. So we feel good about that. And, and I'll, I'll just reiterate that uh, the mistake of fact, and particularly the Castle Doctrine, was asinine to go before this jury. Yeah. They had no business of asserting the Castle Doctrine in someone else's home. I'm glad that the jury simply rejected that. Um, and we can move forward from there. You know, surprised. By, I'm sorry, Mr. Crump. No, I was just going to say, when you think about the Castle Doctrine, it really reminds you a lot of stand your ground mm -hmm. when you come up with an intellectual justification to justify the killing of an unarmed black person. Thank God the jury did not accept it. Exactly. Thank you. Excuse me, sister, were you surprised by this verdict? No. If you sit, if you sit, number one, uh, and I, I said, if we were calling the game, if the, we were calling this like a game, the score was 92 to zero the entire time. The 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 only concern was that the jury instructions. It, it bothered me that those would go back, and in the, and in that case, you could have a, a, a runaway jury in a sense that would go against the entire weight of the evidence. But but when it's all said and done, you had someone who was completely unarmed completely nonviolent, completely non-aggressive, sitting at his home, eating a bowl of ice cream. And someone barged into his home and shot him to death. And so when this family contacted us the day after this murder, we we believed that the right the right conviction would happen. We believed that the right verdict yeah. would come out as guilty. Uh, we knew that in America that's rare. We knew we had a fight on our hands, but there were all the pieces in place. And I'll tell you what, uh, this was a perfect storm of events uh, uh, in terms of the justice system working together. You had a motivated district attorney's office who put on an excellent case. You had a progressive uh, a progressive yeah. judge who made the right calls from the bench. And you had a Dallas County community that responded to uh, the Absolutely. call to serve on these juries as we need them to continue to do. So you had one of the most diverse juries that we ever seen. And, you, and when all those things worked together, I was I was convicted. Uh, I was certain of a conviction in this yeah. case. And let me, say, let me say this. This Dallas County has a precedence, unlike anybody else in America. Remember Jordan Edwards' case. Right. Faith, uh, uh, District Attorney Faith Johnson made sure that that young unarmed child's life was not in vain when they got a conviction there. And now to get a conviction here, hopefully all the rest of the cities all across the United States will learn from Dallas, Texas, Amen. that justice means equal justice. And one final thing, one final thing that we, and we said it before, 
what Mike Rivera did by deleting those text messages, uh -uh. that is something that just cannot go away. That's right. Because <laughs> that was clear tampering with evidence. And that's going to be something that we're going to follow up on, and we're going to make sure that the Dallas Police Department is following the proper procedures because as a result of not following up on people like Mike Rivera, there's a mother that we talked to who, who Mike Rivera took her, took her son's life that's still dealing with that from 2007. So we need to make sure that that's followed up on. What, what, this, what this trial did was it pulled the veil back, and we saw the kind of things that lead to unfair acquittals of police officers. Yeah. We saw a corrupt Dallas Police Department that actively engaged in covering for, excusing, and justifying the unjustifiable. And now that that veil has been pulled back, we are, we've all seen it now. Right. And we, we have an ob obligation on behalf of this family. We have a, a, the, the, each of us in this community has an obligation to go after the bad actors who tried to cover this murder up from the beginning. That's including her partner, Martin Rivera. That's including Mike Mata of the Dallas Police Officers Association. We call on Chief Hall to clean house because we're going to go about the business of cleaning house for her. There you go. So that were the, those were the attorneys for uh, both of Sean's family, um, also putting the Dallas Police Department under indictment, uh, saying that uh, they want a clean house. Um, I do suspect that. Uh, Dallas Police Association President Mike Mata at some point will respond. Uh, there is going to be uh, an internal affairs complaint filed against him. Um, that has not happened yet, but I do suspect that the Dallas Police Association is going to answer back to some of the uh, the allegations here that were uh, given by both of John's family. Obviously, the family is not able to talk. Uh, we want to hear uh, from the family, but again, as I mentioned earlier, they're under a gag order. They are expected to testify. Both of John's family, or mother rather, is going to be one of the first ones to uh, to testify. And so we are watching the family leaving right now as they get in the elevator. Uh, and then they'll be back up here because we will start the punishment phase in this trial uh, this afternoon. They will have opening statements and then they will begin taking witnesses so uh, or calling witnesses to the stand. Uh, that is what is happening here at the uh, at the courthouse. Um, if you heard some of the civil rights lawyers saying that this verdict uh, is for other cases across the country that they have um, activated uh, have been uh, activists for, uh, and so they they believe that this verdict sends a strong strong message to. Uh, to people across the country about police involved type shootings. And I believe we're going to DeMond now uh, because he has in standing with some community activists. Rebecca, I'm standing, I'm standing with Zena West Lewis right now. She was a church member of Botham Johns. You've been monitoring this case all week. What's yes. your reaction to the jury's verdict today? I screamed out and cried because justice has been served. We have been wanting this for years. Back in 97, I did protesting. I got beat up by 12 officers. Now they're seeing that there are corruption. Back then, they wasn't seeing that. So you're not really connected to the John family through faith uh, connections through the church. You've also been an activist out in the streets. Yes. What message does this jury's verdict send to the greater community? It says great one because it let them know that because you're in blue you're not right you're not you're not always right i mean me you we walk across the street police coming to, to us i mean we know that we have our rights how optimistic were you that the jury would come with this decision i already knew it when she said she intended to kill him that intent said murder you sat in the courtroom watching this case. Since day one. In the hallways. How tough was it hearing the evidence unfold? It was very much. Uh, I know for a long time, for a year now, people who knew both of John have been asking for the facts and transparency. And you guys got an eye look into some of the things that uh, no one knew. I can imagine it was shocking for those who knew him and shocking for community members. How tough was it sitting there watching and listening to all those uh, facts? To me, it was more hurtful to see her sit up on the jury 
and to call him a silhouette. Knowing that the TV's on and there is a computer on, you had to see him. What do you want people to remember most about both of John? His smile, his singing voice, and know that God loves him and he's with heaven. He's in heaven. I've heard several activists and community members and even faith leaders say there's more work to do. Very much. What work needs to be done in the community in Dallas? Actually, there's cases that our officers has attacked other people that needs to be addressed. And not only that, uh, the officers that tried to cover up corruption. They need to be addressed. I know the jury still has to do some work. Setting this phase start, you're going to be sitting through that? Yes, I will. Right. Zena, thanks so much for your and time. Not only that, also I work with Judge Howard, Janine Howard. We have the first Friday program on, on 6 4. Zena, thanks so much for your time. Appreciate mm -hmm. that. Thank you. And Kara, what you heard Zena say, she's echoing the sentiments from many community members who've been watching this case over the past year and watching this trial over the past week. Many people very emotional. People still have answers about what happened that night. Many people still have answers about what to do or questions about what to do moving forward. You ladies have been watching this too. Are you guys community members here in Dallas? Huh? You guys are community members here in Dallas as well? Yes. Um, what's your reaction to this jury's verdict? I was ecstatic. I was so happy. I wanted to cry when I was in the, sitting in the courtroom when the judge uh, said the verdict. I wanted to bust out crying because I have a black son. And it's not only they killing black males, black females. What's your name for me? Sheila Bennett. Sheila, what was your biggest fear or concern sitting and watching this trial every day? That she was going to get off scot-free. But both of them didn't get off scot-free. He's not here anymore. And Based on what you heard this week or the past week, what do you want community members to remember most? That it's, it's not about race. It's about justice. That's what I wanted to remember, justice. Thanks so much, Sheila. And you've been monitoring this trial as well? I heard you in the background a moment ago shouting out some victims of police violence. Uh, what's your name for me? My name is Glow. Glow. Vader. Mm -hmm. How are you taking away this verdict? Um, my main concern with this, this whole time has been for the family. And um, over the course of the last year, we've attended rallies and vigils and the gala that happened uh, on Sunday night and I've gotten to know the family and they are at the forefront of my thoughts. And you know ladies this is a case that's not only had local attention but national attention yes. even international, international attention considering yes. they're from St. Lucia. You got to uh, be familiar with the family. Yes. How mm -hmm. important was it for the community members to be surrounding this family? So important. Um, uh, every time that I see them I just I hug them and I tell them I love you. And um, even when they leave, we will still be here and we will still be doing the work. And, and, and I think that they, that gave them comfort. Glow and Sheila, thank you guys so much. And Kara, what you heard from these ladies here, again, echoing sentiments that we've heard from community members across Dallas. You know, it's different um, right now, a different feel around this courtroom. All week long, I've noticed that there was a certain sense of tension and uh, just wondering what was going to happen today. Community members got the answer from the jury with that guilty verdict against Amber Geiger. Kara, we'll be talking to community members and giving you some uh, glimpse of what's on their hearts and minds right now. Kara? Damon, thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, hearing from a lot of people in that courthouse this midday who didn't know both of John, didn't know his family, um, but because of the outcome of this trial, they have gotten to know his family and they say that it will impact them for their lifetime. So just resetting a little bit right here. If you are just joining us on midday, we do have a guilty verdict of murder in the Amber Geiger trial. We want to show you that reaction that happened a little more than a half hour ago. Uh, the jury having reached a verdict, uh, Ms. Geiger and your team, would you please stand? We, the jury, unanimously find the defendant, Amber Geiger, guilty of murder as charged in the indictment. No outburst. And it is signed by the presiding juror, who is juror number 11. Mr. Rogers, would you like to have the jury poll? No, Your Honor. All right. You may be seated, Ms. Geiger. Uh, we're going to take a break.
Um, you all have a long. You heard that stern break. reaction from the judge we asking people reason. not to show reaction, but you could hear audible gasps were told from people who were in the courtroom cheering and a lot of crying coming from both of John's family. Now we cannot hear from both of John's family at this point because they are still going to be witnesses in the sentencing phase, which is set to begin at about one o'clock. But we do know there was a message. Um, yes, Lord, you never failed me yet. Hashtag justice for Botham. That was written by Alice and John, Botham's mother, on her Facebook page. That was shortly after the verdict. So while she cannot speak specifically with media, she did post to that social media not long ago. And we're also seeing, obviously, the other side of this courtroom, which is Amber Geiger. We have yet to see her face, but I do know that she was crying when you're looking at this video. You see um, her bringing a, a tissue up to her eyes. And of course, her family um, having a, a much different reaction sitting behind her her for some time, um, you just kind of holding each other and crying as well. They have since left the courtroom and been taken to a, a location that we do not know of. But at this point right now, we're all waiting for that sentencing phase to begin in a little over an hour. Tanya Iser is with us. She has been uh, following this case. She is, she is at she our is studios at and she's got um, some legal analysis and some expert analysis as we move forward into what's happening now. Okay, so we're having some mic issues. Um, I can kind of hear a little bit of an echo. So we're going to try to get back to Tanya in our Young Street location here in just a minute. But at this point right now, um, we are waiting to hear. We're back. Sorry, I'm getting a couple of different things in my ear. We're going to go back out to Rebecca Lopez right now. Rebecca, uh, right now uh, we are seeing still a flurry of um, excitement from people. We understand there's going to be a celebration at 630 tonight on the courthouse steps from people who are excited about the reaction and the verdict that came down, um, a guilty verdict of murder um, when it comes to Amber Geiger. Have things calmed down at all? Can you kind of uh, let us know what's happening at this point? Uh, there's still a lot of activity here. You have to remember, this is a historic day. Amber Geiger is the first female officer convicted in Dallas County and obviously a DPD of murder. And the last Dallas police officer that was convicted of murder was back in the 70s, and it was an officer that uh, killed a teenage boy in the back of a squad car as he was handcuffed, Santos Rodriguez. You heard one of the community activists talk about that case a little while ago. This is historic. Um, there was a Balt Springs officer, Roy Oliver, that was found guilty of murder uh, earlier, about uh, several months back, uh, of shooting and killing Jordan Edwards, uh, an unarmed teenager that was in a car and was driving away from a party, and he fired into that uh, car and killed him. So it is historic. There's never been a female officer in Dallas County convicted of murder, and only two Dallas police officers that I can recall in the history of DPD that have been convicted of murder. So that is why this is such a, a big, a big deal and uh, here in Dallas County and obviously across the nation, as you heard some of the community activists say, it is difficult to get police officers uh, convicted of murder. This is something that a lot of community activists have been pushing for nationwide to uh, have more officers that use excessive force or kill unarmed people to um, to be taken to trial for murder, to fight it in the, in the uh, court system. So uh, it's a big day here. Back to you guys. Yeah, Rebecca, I want to I want to um, hang on to you for a second, because as you mentioned, a historic day, you have been with WFAA and in the Dallas community for a long time. You've seen a lot of different court cases and trials. Um, comparatively speaking, this is uh, unlike any other. This is unlike anything that has ever happened in the city of Dallas and DPD. I mean, there have been other cases where officers uh, were um, arrested and charged with aggravated assault. There's been a couple of Dallas police officers that have pled guilty in those cases inv involving unarmed uh, people. But this is um, this is unlike anything I've ever seen. I'll never forget the morning when I got the phone call saying a Dallas police officer in uniform that was off duty went into an apartment 
and shot and killed an innocent man. And I, I, I couldn't have been more shocked. Uh, I think no one was prepared. I think even Dallas police were unsure how to handle the case in the beginning. Should it be an officer involved shooting? Should she be treated as a citizen? There was a lot of debate that went on between the DA's office, the Dallas Police Department, the Texas Rangers, how to handle this case because it is unique. It's unusual. I don't think anybody had ever seen anything like this. And so for this jury to take a, a look at this case now and come back with a guilty verdict is, is, is historic, it's huge, and it definitely sends a message that resonates across the nation. I mean, I know this specific case was talking about sure. both John and Amber Geiger, um, but this is resonating with so many people, as we heard, with so many different names that were listed off by both of John's attorneys in regards to other cases um, for African Americans who have been mm -hmm. shot and killed by police officers. So obviously a lot of excitement in there today. Um, have you seen any sign of uh, Amber Geiger's family? And at this point, we understand we're about an hour away from when sentencing will begin. Yeah, I think that what uh, they did with Amber Geiger's family is there's a way to go out through the judges. Um, there's like a judge's exit um, out of the courtroom. So I suspect that they took them out that way. I do not believe that they would have wanted to be taken through the media. Um, there's literally media from all across the world here right now, as you can hear everyone talking around me. So uh, I don't suspect that we're going to hear anything from Amber Geiger's family. Uh, this is a family that has received death threats. Uh, some have lost their jobs. There's been a lot of ramifications for her family as well because of her actions. And so they are protecting the family right now and moving them out of the courthouse quietly. Back to you. Well, Rebecca, we appreciate the insight. Um, we're going to go back to Tanya Iza right now. We'll check back in with you uh, soon. I know a lot's still going on as we get ready for that sentencing phase. And then that sentencing phase, uh, we're going to have Tanya Iza come in. She has some uh, legal analysis for us and, and really giving us some insight on what, uh, what exactly Amber Geiger could face. Obviously, looking at this uh, murder uh, conviction today and the fact that it came back so quickly, uh, a lot of things um, could happen uh, that could maybe surprise or, or be considered unexpected, Tanya. I'm joined by Judge Rob Conyus, a former Judge Rob Conyus. Uh, Judge, the sentencing phase is set to begin at 1 o'clock. What can folks expect to see? Well, what they're going to expect is uh, it'll look very similar to the guilt innocence, but at this phase of the trial, You'll hear more uh, about the effect uh, that, the, that the murder had on Mr. Jean's family uh, and the, you know, what their family had to go through. You'll hear a lot of sympathy, a lot of, a lot of emotion, I'm sure, from them. You know, I, would, I would expect that the prosecution is also going to rehash some of the, the key evidence uh, and make some kind of argument that, that this, this wasn't just a tragedy, it was preventable, and, and even point out some of Ms. Geiger's uh, you know what sh her actions after the shooting, uh, some of the stuff that might that might show her, maybe she didn't have a lot of sympathy. Maybe it, she just kind of went on with her life, that kind of thing, um, to to get the jury to 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 a point where they could come back with a heavy sentence. And Miss Geiger will also have the opportunity to present evidence, uh, most likely from maybe her family, co-workers, people who have served with her to say. That's not my daughter. That's not my. That's not my friend. That she's not like that. Do you think we'll hear from Amber Geiger again? I wouldn't be shocked. I wouldn't be shocked at this phase of the trial. You know, she'll get up there and say, I, you know, I, I, I disagree with the verdict, but I, I respect it, and you know, have mercy on me because you know, I, this being a police officer was my dream, and so on and so on. You'll hear things like that. So I, I think she needs to get up there again and do a better job of maybe having an emotional connection with the jury <coughs> excuse me with the jury um, yeah. we've had we've had two other officers uh, farmers branch officer uh, Ken Johnson who was sentenced to 10 years for chasing down a team burglar and, and shooting and killing him we also had Roy Oliver who shot into a fleeing car and he got 15 years Ken Johnson again got 10 any, any any thoughts on what's going to be going into the jury's determination of what her sentence should be? Yeah, the um, well, the jury won't be able to compare. It won't be appropriate for them to compare. Well, that that officer got that amount of years for that case. They won't be able to compare any of that. So they'll have to just take these facts and make a decision of five to ninety nine or life. But um, if that if those cases are kind of any guide. For those, for those of us watching about how jurors see 
uh, the balance between what police officers do and, and the situations that they're in, um, you know, that those sentences might be a guide of what might happen here. But is the fact that they found her guilty of murder an indicator that this could be harsher? It could be. It could be. I think, um, you know, uh, I, they certainly did not trust her enough to go with her mistake of fact story. And so if uh, uh, some of it may depend on how the jurors viewed that, if it was, well, it does not really applicable here or which did they feel like she was trying to get one over on them to to get an acquittal? It's really hard to know, but um, but I think uh, uh, I think the jury will they'll have a lot of factors to consider again, very much like the guilt innocence. And so. it's important to note that she cannot get probation. Very important to know that she cannot get probation from the jury. I mean, yeah, from the jury, and uh, whatever sentence she gets, she'll have to serve either half of that or a minimum of 30 years, whichever is less. And explain to people what the what the rules would be in terms of her being out on an appeal. So, if the jury comes back with a sentence of 10 years or less, she'll be eligible to appeal to the judge for what we call an appellate bond. She'll notify the judge, hey judge, I'm, I'm going to appeal my, my guilty verdict and I would like to be out of prison while I wait the, the decision of the appellate court. If the jury comes back with 11 years or higher, then she won't be eligible to, to, apply, to appeal to the judge for that and uh, she'll have to wait out her appeal in prison. Any, any thoughts on how long you would expect the punishment phase to last? It's going to go quicker for sure. Uh, you know, uh, I'm assuming she doesn't have any type of criminal record. Um, I'll be interested to see if she had any discipl disciplinary issues with DPD. Um, if it, barring any of that, then it's basically, you know, what effect did the did this uh, crime have on the victim's family, on her family, and how she's going to appeal to the to the jury for leniency. Well, we saw her mother in the courtroom, so. Pretty good chance that we'll hear from Amber Geiger's mother. Yeah, I was a little surprised that we didn't hear from one of them in, in the guilt innocence phase. Uh, I would be even more shocked if we don't hear from a family member, a friend, a co worker, somebody who can say Amber Geiger is not the person that the prosecution says she is. And, and similar to guilt innocence, there'll be but opening statements and closing yeah. statements, it's kind of like its own little mini trial. That's right, it's a very much a mini trial. You'll hear, you'll hear all the, the, the same procedures will be followed again. Opening statement, uh, the prosecution gets to go first, present their evidence, then defense gets to put on their evidence, then we'll have closing arguments, then uh, another jury charge. Jury goes back and begins deliberating and uh, so it'll is very much a mini trial. Okay, thank you so much Judge Conyus. I'll send it back to, to Kara. Great insight. Thank you, Tanya. We appreciate it. So again, they will continue that uh, legal analysis and they'll continue to um, dissect what the jury comes down with as far as the sentencing phase is concerned. That will be streaming live on our Facebook page, so make sure you join us for that. Tanya has been doing that with expert legal analysis all week long. We're also going to continue to stay on on YouTube. We are on our social media platforms with uh, Twitter and as I mentioned Facebook as well and then we'll be back on here today at four o'clock but again if you have just tuned in to midday we understand Amber Geiger found guilty in the found guilty of murder in the shooting death of Botham Jean we have people inside the courtroom outside the courthouse that are getting reaction and we do anticipate that that sentencing phase will start at one o'clock after a long recess and that's when as you heard Tanya mention it'll be sort of a mini trial and they will have people who will get back on the stand and testify and then that possible sentence between five to 99 years for that murder conviction. As I mentioned again, we're always on at WFAA.com. Thank you for being with us this midday, and we'll see you back here on air at four o'clock. Uh, Judge, we're back here on Facebook. So some emotional moments, uh, how what are your thoughts on this verdict? I, I'm, I am surprised uh, to, the, to the extent that I've always thought that the prosecution had the hardest road to go down. And so, you know, I, I, I thought I, I would have been less surprised if it had been manslaughter, probably even less, even more or less surprised if it had been a criminally negligent homicide. Um, but, and that which I know wasn't before the jury, but just uh, before the charge was read, I, I, maybe that, that might have also been appropriate. 
But um, so I am surprised that, that they went with murder because they would have had to, the jury would have had to discarded her um, mistake of fact. They, they just didn't like her and they didn't believe her. They did, they would have had to discard the self defense and and overcome reasonable doubt. So, it, you know, the fact that that uh, they, they didn't like her, then that would have made it harder for them to believe her, and they really needed to believe her for her defense to work. Uh, what did you make of some of what we heard from Lee Merritt and, and Ben Crump and some of the attorneys? I mean, they're framing it within this sort of uh, all these other controversial police shootings. What's your thoughts on that? Well, you know, there's no doubt that uh, there's so much tension between communities of color and law enforcement. Uh, and it goes back the whole history of the country. So it's, I, I am not surprised that this case has taken on as, as part of that discussion. Um, you know, uh, those attorneys, they are, I'm assuming they're gonna be the lead attorneys in the federal lawsuit. So they also have to begin uh, setting the foundation for that lawsuit. Um, but I think in the broader context, you know, if some good can come out of Mr. John's um, uh, death is that uh, those of us who have worked in the criminal justice system our whole careers and communities of color uh, can can continue the discussion to lead to some progress so um, uh, justice can prevail. So I, I, I understand a lot of where they're coming from. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you, Judge. We're going to take a break and go to lunch. Uh, we'll be back at 1 o'clock, and then we will, as the punishment phase begins in the Amber Geiger trial.
I'm Tanya Eiser, an investigative report, reporter here at WFA. I'm still joined by uh, former Judge Rob Conyus. We've got you for a few more minutes mm -hmm. before you have to uh, go off and uh, do some work that, that pays money. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Judge, let's, let's just kind of recap. Mm -hmm. So this morning, this 12-member jury of eight women, four men, found Amber Geiger guilty of murder, clearly rejecting her claims, and it seems pretty clear that they frankly just didn't like her. Mm -hmm. Um, what do you talk to us? To talk to viewers about what they can expect to see in this punishment phase. Well, the punishment phase is the phase of the trial where uh, Miss Geiger is going to be asking for leniency, and so evidence that's that's relevant towards her character, uh, what kind of life has she led, uh, is all going to come into play. Also, the impact of the crime on Mr. Jean's family uh, is also going to be, uh, I would expect a heavy piece of evidence that the prosecution is going to want to put on and so I would expect to hear from his mom his mother other family members likewise for Miss Geiger I would I would I would be shocked if we don't hear from a family member uh, a co-worker somebody who can say you know that's that's not like her um, and, or this is what would happen if you sentence her to you know 99 years in life this is the loss to our family and so it's not really a comparison of, of, of Mr. Jean versus Miss Geiger, but um, so it's going to be that type of evidence. And so she doesn't have, as far as I know, she doesn't have a criminal record, but criminal records would be the kind of thing you would hear at this stage. Um, you know, does she have any disciplinary actions against her DPD? You might hear something like that, but, uh, but it, it could just be have mercy on me. In some ways, it's kind of like a mini trial. Very much. It's, we're going to hear opening statements, testimony, and then closing statements. Right. It's going to look almost exactly like the guilt innocence, but just on punishment. So you're exactly you're right. You opening statement, evidence, presentation of evidence, closing statements, another uh, legal charge for the jury to take back uh, with them, and then they deliberate again. You know, in some cases, uh, you know. Uh, Criminal, pr criminal practice professionals, I say this case is really about punishment. It's not about guilt innocence. I'm just referring generally, not specifically about this case. So, you know, the jury could be out twice as long as they were guilt innocence on punishment, you know, because that, that ultimately now is going to be the biggest message that they can send, you know. Um, in Dallas County, we've had two police officers who've been convicted of murder. Ken Johnson, who was a Farmer's Branch police officer who chased down uh, a teenage burglar and shot and killed him in a car. Uh, we had Roy Oliver, who uh, was a Balt Springs police officer, um, who shot into a moving vehicle, a fleeing vehicle, and he got 15 years. What would you expect to go into the jury's decision making to determine what kind of sentence she should face? Well, the jury's not going to know any of that. It, it's not proper for a jury to be told hey, in other cases similar to this, this is what the punishment was. Uh, the jury has to make this, deci this decision completely in a silo, in a vacuum. And they've been instance. sequestered. And they've been sequestered. So while it wouldn't be unreasonable for the jury to maybe have knowledge of these past cases, they're going to be asked and, and required to disregard that and just make a decision based on this. And so... Um, you know, uh, it, you know, Texas is one of a handful of states in the country that defendants actually have a right to a jury at the punishment stage. In most other states, uh, the judges automatically make the decision. So um, you, you can see the positives and negatives of that. But um, so in this case, uh, the jury's going to just have to make its decision on what happened here and nothing else. And the sentence could be five to ninety-nine. Five to ninety-nine, and or no life. possibility of parole. No nope. probation, sorry. Yeah, no, no probation is possible. And she has to serve half of whatever sentence she's given. Right, because because she used a firearm and because this was a murder case, the law requires that whatever sentence she gets, she has to serve half of it or uh, thirty years, whichever number is lower. So some people on Facebook they don't they don't like me saying that the jury didn't like her, and, mm -hmm. and I. It, I think what I'm trying to refer to is that obviously when, when a jury's making the decisions, they're making decisions on the evidence, but clearly how much of a role would all the sexting, because there was a, 
That's the kind of thing that would make her appear pretty unlikable. Right, and so it really comes down to trust and, and credibility. And so we've always said that this case is about her credibility and whether or not, if, if the jury was, if she had a chance of being acquitted. And that's the kind of thing that would make you trust her less. Exactly, and because, because the jury might, was probably inclined to not really trust her on such a big case, such a big decision, then they had to look elsewhere to see what was more reasonable, which, what, what, what version of facts was more trustworthy to them. And um, so that's kind of how that sexting is. As non-consequential as, as that may be, it does have an impact in terms of uh, your credibility. The, um, and then folks have been asking, uh, will she be taken into custody uh, awaiting the sentencing phase. So how does this work? Yeah, so the way it'll work is, yes, right now she's in custody. She wouldn't, she, she's going to be allowed to leave the courtroom, but she really couldn't leave the courthouse. Uh, she's going to be booked in uh, when, the, when we're done for the day. Now, the judge could give her a P, what's called a per, personal recognizance bond and let her stay out for the remainder of the trial, but... You think uh, that's likely? I don't think that's likely. Um, I, I, I think the judge, I think she's going to go into... Uh, kind of what we always, whatever the normal th course of business would be, that's what she's going to do. Exactly. So she'll be, she'll be spending the night at least there at jail tonight, I would suspect. Uh, once we get a punishment and we know what that is, then we'll know if she can appeal to, to, to be let out of jail while her appeal is pending. Um, when, when Amber Geiger, presumably, takes the stand here in the punishment phase, what does she have to do? Well, I think she's going to have to do a better job of connecting with this jury. I mean, maybe that might be a lost cause. Maybe they have uh, already written her off as a source of, of reliant, reliable testimony, but I think she still needs to try. She needs to, she needs to get up there and really communicate her circumstance, um, the effect of a long prison sentence might have on her, her family, uh, people in her life. You know, again, it's not a comparison between her and Mr. Jean, but 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 it uh, will be. But it will be, and uh, and so she needs to she needs to really try to connect uh, in that way. Um, you know, she can get up there and say, "Look, I disagree with the verdict, but I respect it. I'm extremely again, I'm extremely sorry about what happened, so on and so on." But she really needs to give the jury some reason to think you're you're a person who deserves leniency and that we're not making a bad decision by giving it to you. Um, let's talk about, uh, there's been some questions about uh, a potential appeal. What would you see going into an appeal in this case? You know, the, well, the first thing you, to, to, get, to have a, a grounds for appeal, you have to have objections to evidence. And, and the defense team here didn't do a lot of objecting. So there aren't a lot of points in the trial that you can look at to say, oh, there, there's a, there's a, a ground for appeal. You know, I, I, I can, I know litigators, we all have our different uh, uh, theories and pre preferences when it comes to objecting. Uh, I think they probably could have objected more um, in certain spots, but um, I think in terms of the, the one big area that I think if they're going to have grounds for an appeal that might actually hold, um, would, might actually hold would be when the judge excluded the defense experts. And uh, appellate courts really, their ears perk up when they hear cases where the trial court judge didn't allow a criminal defendant to tell their side of the story. And you don't have to like their side of the story, you don't have to believe their side of the story, but you have to give them a chance to tell it. And arguably that didn't happen here. Would you expect, uh, if you're the prosecution, are you putting both of John's mom on the stand first? First, yes, I, I think, I think, uh, I think the the um, the jury will would like to hear from his family again. Uh, we heard from the sister already, but maybe from the mom. You know, this is it's uh, she's going to be able to have the biggest emotional impact on the jury. I mean, we were talking about it at lunch. I mean, just being parents ourselves, it's not hard to empathize with her oh, and that oh. she lost a son. So, you know, but I also expect the state to to bring to remind the jury about 
what Ms. the things Miss Geiger did after the shooting that don't really put her in a good light either. The questions about CPR and, and texting right. while you're on the phone with 911. Exactly. And yeah. Just so. all those things that that. Right. They kind of go to their argument's going to be that she's she's callous. She hasn't that shown remorse. Didn't show enough remorse. You know, wasn't completely focused on him. She wasn't being completely selfless. She was being un, in, uh, selfish. You know, so you could you could anticipate that argument. Well, somebody, uh, another lawyer, uh, texted me about the outburst in court after the. Um, the, the verdict, you know, we're, we sh heard somebody shout, shut up. I mean, it, we're, we had some some shouts of obviously happiness and, and someone shouted shut up. I'm not clear on who mm -hmm. that was, but um, would you expect any kind of effort by the defense to try to raise some objections here? Or, uh, I mean, I, they, haven't sh they haven't shown a propensity to object so far. Right, and I thought that was an interesting take on it. Um, you know, that that particular outburst in the courtroom would it have an effect on the jury now that they're moving into punishment? Because the, the jury still has to be objective. They still have to be base their decision on the facts. Um, and so if, they, if, if, if there was too much emotion shown in the courtroom, would, they have, would the jury now be affected by that? That's going to be a hard argument for the defense to make. I, I think it's worthy of at least an objection. Uh, if for no other reason to, to preserve the issue for an appeal. Uh, but uh, from what I was able to hear in the courtroom outburst, it was pretty short-lived. The judge pretty, pretty much put a clamp on that. Um, so I think they would, the defense would have a hard time making a, an argument that would stick to, to get the judge to do something that different than what we expect is about to happen. Any thoughts on how long we can expect deliberations? It, it, well, deliberations, uh, it'd be a little hard to know, but I think the evidence phase of the punishment stage will be, I think, shorter than the, than, um, the guilt innocence. I wouldn't be shocked if, the, if tomorrow afternoon the jury begins deliberating on punishment. You know, um, sometimes cases, the, the, the sentencing can be harder for the jury than the guilt innocence phase. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll obviously know it after, every, after all the verdicts are in, how the jury felt about Ms. Geiger. But, you know, they, there could have been maybe in their mind, let's find her guilty of the murder, let's consider being lenient during sentencing. Uh, I've seen that happen in murder cases before. Do you think uh, we'll hear from some of the jurors? Do you think he'll talk? That's a good question. Uh, without knowing more about the makeup of the jury, it's hard to really predict that. If you have some outspoken folks on there, um, uh, you know, I, I, just knowing from other cases from around the country, you do. I'm always a little surprised when you do hear jurors talk, um, but uh, but um, I, I guess I really wouldn't be surprised in this case. Yeah. Um, if you're the defense, uh, let's start with the prosecution. If you're the prosecution, what's the story that you're going to tell in this punishment phase? That uh, the story you want, you want to reiterate very strongly, this was a man eating ice cream in his apartment. You know, he didn't, he, he didn't do anything to anybody. He's he wasn't, not armed. He wasn't armed. And uh, this, this woman comes through his door with a gun, and 30 seconds later, he's dead you know, how could that possibly happen? And um, so you focus on that, and you focus on that the fact that, you know, his family has lost him. You focus on her lack of complete selflessness in, in the moments after the shooting. Um, and, and that's your story if you're the prosecution. If you're the defense, you're pro you're, your argument's gonna be, look, we can't bring Mr. Jean back but we, we can deal with this we life. We can send a message. We can send a message and still deal with this young life that we have in front of us. You know, is this, you know, this was a horrible mistake. There's no evidence that she was out to get Mr. Jean, that if things had just turned a little differently, you know, both of them, we, we wouldn't even be here talking about it because nothing would have happened. So are you really going to sentence someone to prison for the rest of their life for, 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 uh, 
a two-minute mistake, a very tragic mistake, but that's going to be their argument. Um, uh, somebody asked, does the jury have to be unanimous on sentencing? They do. They do. So uh, the same rules apply. So if the jury cannot come up with a, a, a number, unanimous number, then a mistrial could also happen. And then you have what would happen in that sense is you don't go all the way back to the beginning of guilt innocence. You just have a new trial as to punishment. And so it would be a different set of jurors, but you would have to rehash all the punishment evidence again. Um, it, that's usually less likely, especially when you have a, a high range of numbers to consider. Um, I, I, I would be less, I, I would be, I'm not anticipating a mistrial at this point. Somebody's asking about um, premeditation and murder. Um, Walk us through. In, in Texas, murder doesn't require premeditation. Correct. In, in other states, you've and you hear it on TV all the time, uh, the premeditation, the planning of a murder. In Texas, you don't need to prove that to get murder. Obviously, like in this case, premeditation, though, if it exists, obviously will go in punishment to look. You actually planned to kill somebody. You went through. You did all these things. You bought a gun. You stalked the person. Whatever the facts may be. And that just shows your, your heinousness, your, your callousness, your, your danger to the community. Um, in a case like this where there's none of that, uh, you know, it's not, it, you're just not going to even, it's, I, I would be shocked if anybody even tries to bring it up. Well, and typically whenever you have a premeditation to it, we're going to get into capital murder because capital murder, which carries the death penalty, mm -hmm. uh, involves... A felony, right? You, can, you committed the murder and the commission of a felony, and that, and, and uh, you know, so that's usually when you get into the elements of premeditation, right? Typically. Exactly, because you're already committing either some type of crime, other crime, and robbery, robbery, or whatever it is. kidnapping, whatever. Yeah. So. Well, have you? Can you ever recall? I know you're. I know you're having to leave here. Oh, in a yeah, few minutes. Sure, you're yeah. looking at the clock. Yeah. Tell me, tell me much longer <laughs> you have. Um, the. Um, the castle doctrine. Have you ever seen the castle doctrine used this way? I mean, obviously, it's, it almost turned the castle doctrine on its head. It totally turned the castle doctrine on its head, and it, it's, it would not have even been in the discussion but for the mistake of fact. And so, obviously, the jury didn't go there, but normally uh, the castle doctrine would not protect somebody who's entering somebody else's property. That's just not what it was designed for. It was designed for the opposite. So, if Mr. John had killed Miss Geiger under these same circumstances, you know, he would have had the full protection of the law in that in that instance under the Castle Doctrine, because that's the person, that's the the point of view. The Castle right, Doctrine, right? Because the Castle Doctrine protects the homeowner. That's right. Not the intruder. In that's this right. case, she was the intruder. Right. That's right. And it's also pretty clear that the jury didn't. I mean, you had all this testimony that other people had walked to the wrong floor, parked on the wrong floor, went to the wrong apartment, even somebody who went into the wrong apartment. But they're basically, is your sense that they look at her and they say, you're a trained officer, you're trained to notice things? I think that's right. And I think uh, also in those other situations, you know, nothing tragic happened. You know, if, if Miss Geiger was just on a day on her day off and didn't have her gun with her, you know, this wouldn't have happened either. But, but I think they were looking at her training and say, look, you're a trained officer, number one, you should have noticed things, and number two, when you got into that situation, you, of all people, had the training to do something different, you know. Well, we're going to take a break. We'll leave the stream up because we are expecting the, uh, this to start back up any moment. Uh, the judge had said that they would be back at 1 o'clock, and we're just waiting on it to kick off. Obviously, we're still sitting here looking at this uh, state of Texas uh, seal. So I'm going to let Judge Kanyas go since he's got to, to go do other work. And I appreciate it. Thank you so sure. much for joining us. No, it's been absolutely. Great this week. Yeah, thank you.
the jury, there are some pieces of evidence that the state would like to offer up. Um, they're under business records affidavit, but I do believe that the defense will have an objection to them. Okay. What numbers are those? They're going to be state's exhibit number 400, 401, <coughs> and 402. And exactly what are they? State's exhibit number 400 is a applicant process unit records from the Dallas Police Department uh, related to the defendant. And it was tendered to the defense attorney and under business records after David on August 9, 2019. Applicant process. Applicant process unit records. These are going to be the application filed from the defendant's first um, attempt to apply to the Dallas Police Department. said her first attempt to apply? That's correct, Your Honor. Did there were two. She applied multiple times. And 401? 401, Your Honor, is going to be the defendant's personnel file. And this contains, again, also under business records affidavit that was tendered to the defense on August 9, 2019. And this file contains uh, background information provided by the defendant throughout the application process through the Dallas Police Department, including her social media uh, Pinterest account name. Um, it includes the polygraph information related to her application to the police, Dallas Police Department as well, and statements and things that she's made. You said a polygraph? That's correct, Your Honor. What was the nature of the polygraph? The defendant failed her first polygraph for the defiles. Police Department. Well, generally speaking, polygraph. And not to admit the actual contents of, I guess, the polygraph itself, but the fact that she failed it, and that was part of the reason why she applied a second time. The Dallas Police Department allowed her time to reapply. Are you alleging that there's something pertinent to the social media? Yes, Your Honor, there are certain posts that were made by the defendant on her Pinterest account that I think is relevant for the uh, trier of fact to consider. And In States 402? Yes. That's going to be a, a copy of the defendant's internal affairs file, a division file from the Dallas Police Department. And uh, particularly within that file, there are certain um, allegations for misconduct that were sustained against the defendant or that she received uh, counseling for. <coughs> Sorry, Sorry, that she received counseling for. Okay. You've had an opportunity to, to review uh, States Exhibit 400, 401, and 402? Yes, Your Honor. And may I see those, please? Yes, Your Honor. And under what basis are you proffering these? Uh, all purposes, Your Honor. Which one is this? Well, that should be 401. This is 402. And then this is 400. and every act 
uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, so it's it's uh, has a considerable amount of hearsay as far as the reasons for that she was rejected. That was hearsay now, from other officers. Okay, wait. We're talking about state's state exhibit four hundred. That's just the two thousand and twelve application, Your Honor. Right. The other stuff is the personal file that's yeah, going to be four hundred. I don't, I don't see any of, of that. It states four hundred, Your Honor. It mentions the fact that the defendant was denied by the Fort Worth Police Department, and that's the first application for the Dallas Police Department. And Judge, that's that's hearsay. We have to. Uh, uh, this it's. It's hearsay. We don't know the context of, of what the Fort, Fort Worth Police Department decided, and it's um, uh, and it's not relevant, Judge. And if I may respond, Your Honor, these are admissions made by the defendant. This is information that the defendant wrote on application seeking employment of the Dallas Police Department. I found the Fort Worth reference. Where she is asked, Have you ever applied with any law enforcement agency or fire department or related work, including cadet or explorer? And her answer, or the answer was yes. And then it asked for the date, position, and disposition. And she indicates that she applied to the Fort Worth Police Department and was denied to be a police officer. And there was another application to the DFW Airport Police, although it doesn't indicate a disposition. And that's correct, Your Honor. No references in here to any. Oh, here. Have you ever smoked or experimented with marijuana? The answer is yes, on three occasions beginning in July of 2009 and ending in June of 2011. purchased by her or never possessed more than four ounces. First time she was right out of high school with friends. He then allegedly two times in 2011 at someone's birthday, a friend's birthday. <coughs> And this was completed on August 23rd of 2012. That's correct, Your Honor. And Mr. Rogers, your objections to 400? Just the, the, her admission that she was denied by the Fort Worth Police Department uh, is not relevant. It's more prejudicial than probative. Uh, her admission of marijuana usage and the, the subsequent discussion of that in the application process, again, is, is uh, not relevant and more prejudicial than probative. Let's look at 401. 
Yes, Your Honor. That's the personnel file. And um, the state, I know it's quite voluminous, Your Honor, and uh, the state, in order to not create a, a situation, and especially in regards to the polygraph, the state, as far as 401, there is a page in there that mentions the defendant's social media accounts where the defendant self-reported which account she had and the names of those accounts. <coughs> if that is the only page of state's 401 uh, that the court would allow, the state is fine with that. Okay, so just so we're clear, uh, allegedly this exhibit States 401. 401 contains 334 pages. That's correct, Your Honor. And there are a host of flags that you. That's have. correct, Your Honor. And I can point out exactly which one is the social media if the court would like. Well, I see you have a tag, tag in your the social media. And I'm presuming that um, the city of Dallas did the redaction of the yes, Your Honor. identifying information. That is correct. <coughs> So where you have social accounts, all of the pages subsequent to this, how many pages? No, Your Honor, just that page. Uh, just this lists, one page? Where it lists down here. Where it lists Pinterest? That's correct. Groupon? That's correct. And is that score center? That's correct. And the usernames for those different accounts. Of this entire personnel file, you want this one page? Have you? There's more information in there, but I believe, as the defense has uh, mentioned, um, that there are some objections to other things, and including, more specifically, there was the polygraph that the defendant, um, that's listed within that uh, state's 401. The relevance or the purpose for the polygraph is that the defendant failed her first polygraph, but that, of course, was related in connection to the usage or the recency of usage, amongst other things. So the examiner asked the question <coughs> if, if it was 2011 was the last time you used, let me just make sure I have Your last marijuana usage was 2011 in June. Is that the question that she failed on the polygraph? It's that in subsequent. So there's two polygraphs. There's different dates given, different um, time frames that are given, and then maybe some mentioning of any other sort of, I guess, uh, crimes that may have been committed. In the polygraph? There were not identified on this application? That's correct. There aren't any crimes at all, Your Honor, but it's just self admissions and self reporting, too. Did, did the examiner elicit what the crimes were? Yes, it was self reported, Your Honor. Well, and it wasn't actually, so we're discussing a theft that occurred at her prior. Um, it was a business location. She worked at TGI Friday. She admitted she <coughs> stole a, a, or took a pencil and a brownie without permission. And so those things were what led to the issues with the polygraph. A pencil and a brownie? That's correct, Your Honor, and the state's not wanting to admit, uh, not so wanting to not, get into any of that. That's correct. Well, let me be clear. You want to proffer that she failed the polygraph, but you don't want to say it was for the theft of a brownie and a pencil. Well, if the court will allow such things, then the state can, but we don't think that that's um, really a pressing issue. Okay. It's hard for me to line up with this polygraph. What are the pressing issues from Those were the only things with the polygraph, Your Honor, and the personnel file. Okay. And you want this single page that identifies three social media? Outlets? Yes, Your Honor. That's correct. Score, Center, Groupon, and Pinterest. That's correct. Mr. Rogers. With regard to 
question. Of, I'm kind of unclear, but if the, if if we're I'm, I haven't made decisions. I'm inquiring, if, trying to understand. If the she's scope. just offering one page from the personnel file that you just identified that has the three social media accounts, then I don't have an objection to that. To that portion of her personnel file. To that one page. No objection to the one page identifying the social media. That's correct, Your Honor. That's all you want out of this personnel file. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. That'll save me some time in reading all of this. <laughs> Rogers can be well informed 
we make <coughs> objection C like. She has a copy of the disciplinary action that took place on September 24th, 2018. Yes, yes, Your Honor. And your objections to that? Yes, Your Honor. Um, so, um, with regard to investigation control number 2018 183, um, the, the the report contains uh, actions uh, completed by other officers and reports of officers that is hearsay within hearsay. Uh, the, the report also contains uh, Garrity uh, information derived by my client that normally the district attorney's office uh, has redacted, but in this case, uh, I don't, it, there's uh, there's a page in the there's a part of the investigation which says what Amber Geiger summarizes Amber Geiger's internal statement. Uh, that's a violation of Garrity v. New Jersey. Wait a minute, I haven't seen the summary. The Garrity in information. I, I don't. I, I haven't read every document she just handed me for this investigation, but I have not seen the. <laughs> Garrity information has yeah, been. Yeah. Garrity information has been redacted from the state's file, just so that the record's clear the defense received the full file. I see what they offered.
search under investigation. It says officer testimony uh, to summary of the uh, her internal statement. The, I don't see the officer testimony. It's, and it says judge. The, and it says officer testimony. I know that's what it says, but it just lists, uh, it just states September 9th, Officer Geiger was placed under arrest in Kaufman County by the Texas Rangers and booked into the Kaufman County Jail for the charge of manslaughter. Right, and that's, that's the sum total of officer testimony. Right, that's that's my client's statement. That's the, the internal statement provided by Amber Geiger on whatever day that was. This is her statement. She said to them, I was arrested. So right. You don't think they could have found this information from some other source? I know they could have. Because there's not a reference to any statements that are made. Except for this heading. Well, Judge, I, I can. Normally they redact that because that is the uh, investigator's uh, <coughs> submission of a summary of Officer Geiger's internal statement. Um, whether they could get it, of course they could get it from other uh, other sources, but they included it in there, and that is a violation of Garrity v. New Jersey, the statement that she uh, gave uh, was, she was told that that statement, nor the fruits of that statement, could be used against her in any, any criminal proceeding. I don't mean to understand how this is her statement. It is literally a factual recitation of what happened on September 9, 2018. Right, Judge. She, she, they asked her to give an internal statement asking her if she was arrested. She, they gave her the Garrity warning, and she gave a statement admitting that she was arrested. <coughs> Judge, and the state doesn't, uh, defense attorney is correct that typically, and as is followed in this case, for public integrity, the file is redacted of Garrity. I, neither have any of the prosecution team seen any Garrity statements made by the defendant. I couldn't even tell you what was in a statement, let alone, I guess, that there was, in fact, one. It's, Judge, I'm just, I'm not, I've got to, that is, is, is a summary of her internal statement. I know it's, it's short, but it's in there. <coughs> and, and I'm that, having a hard time grasping that this is testimonial or provided subject to interrogation because it just states on a date certain, she was arrested in Kaufman County by the Texas Rangers and booked into the Kaufman County Jail. Right, above that, Judge, it says internal, no, just the- I see the heading. Officer testimony, is that- It says investigation, officer testimony. So you want to object to this paragraph where they summarize I, what allegedly happened on September 9th. They are, they are, the way, that as her officer the way those, in, the way they, they write those investigations, Judge, and I've seen hundreds of them, is the they're they're going to say here's what the, here was here's what the officer testimony is related to this. The only officer testimony in this case was Amber Geiger's, and they put her statement in there in their summary. That, in regardless of what information is in there it still is a violation of Verity v. New Jersey. And, and, and Judge, we don't have the actual investigator here, I think it was Sergeant Criddle here, to explain the context of, of the investigation. Furthermore, it contains you know, hearsay, the, the booking. Um, well, are you, are you offering this? No. no. So I, I'm presuming you want these one, two, three. Will like to do is still talk about the pages 
that list whether or not there was a sustained finding for an allegation. That is a one page that looks like it's, one page. it's a one page where there's no other information. It just states what the violation was and whether the allegation was sustained or not. Like this right here. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, Judge. Well, so this is the this is the statement of Major Ramirez with his findings uh, with uh, internal affairs, and so the information glean in here, one is that it, it, it implies that there was that, that there was some type of investigation into this adverse conduct and that uh, it, it leaves up, we don't know what Major Ramirez's thoughts are. Uh, Let me see that first portion that you provided to me. And also it's basically it's just the fact that there was a warrant, we know she was arrested, uh, the fact that there that there was a warrant for manslaughter and that she was put into the Kaufman County Jail, um, the ranger has already testified in response to whether or not he believes today there's probable cause for that same offense, and the findings of Major Ramirez are hearsay and. The, uh, the actual conduct and acts that it's talking about are the fact that she was arrested for manslaughter and booked into the Coffin County Jail, and that's more prejudicial okay. than probative. Well, here is <coughs> So you allege that part of the administrative investigation included testimonial evidence from the sky. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. Would this be sufficient that we this portion here that begins as a result of her actions, Officer Geiger shall be held accountable for the following rule violation. And then they state the code of conduct violation. And then their findings. So, in essence, in these last two paragraphs, in this sentence, and that doesn't have any testimonial or alleged. I have the rest of this. I was reading through it, and there are references to testimonial evidence. If you take the last paragraphs from that page, I guess you need to redact whatever else is preceding that. And what are your objections to the portions that I've excised? Judge, I, I object that these are the findings of Major Ramirez with the Dallas Police Department. So it's, it's hearsay within hearsay. And so we don't have the context of <coughs> the alleged rule violation, uh, what, what he considered in, in but the rule is concisely stated there. Right. In essence, I, I don't can't hold it verbatim, but it's, uh, I think it's conduct that reflects negatively on the department. Right. And words to that effect. Right. And part of his. Uh, and it just goes on to state, you've been arrested <coughs> for the offense of manslaughter. And that's conduct and while that is unbecoming to the department. And as a result of that being determined. Right. It's a conclusion made by uh, Major Ramirez that it's hearsay within hearsay, and I, uh, it uh, violates the confrontation clause, and I don't have the ability to cross examine Major Ramirez on the context of the rule violation and elicit testimony regarding that. Uh, additionally, it is uh, not not relevant, the fact that she was fired from her job. We're not trying to say that she's still a police officer. The fact that she was arrested for manslaughter um, and booked into Kaufman County Jail um, is more prejudicial than probative um, unless I have the opportunity to call the ranger and respond. Yes. And Judge, oh, wait, 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 wait. Everybody that faces a felony indictment somewhere along the way is arrested. Right. 
So your argument that that's prejudicial, more prejudicial than probative, is overruled. Now, I've tried to excise out all references to any testimony. The portion that I have directed you all to simply states what the rule is and what the finding is. Okay. Your objection to that will be overruled in as much as that is part of the business records affidavit that accompanies 402. Thank you. Is there something else Nothing in that else. big old stack of stuff? Nothing else, Your so Honor. That the state we have fought to. for a half hour about the fact as to whether or not Ms. Gardner was terminated. But I want to make sure. The I didn't rule on the application process. And I thought I was writing down your objections to 400. I don't think I did. Let me go back. As to 402, your objection that that's too prejudicial is overruled. The excise portion, I'm asking you to redact. Yes, Your Honor. And just so we're clear, <coughs> you know what I'm talking about, Mr. Yes, Mr. Yes, ma'am. At the very bottom. Yes. Yeah, right. Okay. So you'll redact that. Yes, Your Honor. That will be admitted as to 402. 401, you have no objections to the social media accounts page. I know it identifies some other things, but the pertinent identifying information has been redacted. Right, so just that one page, correct? And just you take a look at that one that we're talking about. Right. I don't know where. Okay. I'm good with that, Judge. Well, I'm not sure. Anyway. And back to the initial application. Now, the initial application, you indicate that the application was denied for a multitude of reasons. Is that correct? That's correct, Your Honor. And or at least it just states that on. I don't think they give a reason. No, the defendant self-reported denied at Fort Worth, and then that was her first time with the Dallas Police Department. She was not accepted at that time. Do they have rules that tell you? They, not specifically, no, Your Honor. The only other thing listed in that would be the marijuana usage. And Mr. Rogers, I thought I had written down your objections to the first application denial. There's the fact that she was denied by Fort Worth PD is more prejudicial, is not relevant, and it's more prejudicial than probative. And the marijuana usage is not relevant and more prejudicial than probative. And the state's response, Your Honor, is that this is punishment based. The trier of fact can consider all information, I think, especially in guilt innocence, that there was discussions about our victim's marijuana usage. Okay. I'm going to allow you to use things for 400. Your objections are overruled. Okay, I'm sorry. I know you all came in here and waited at 1 o'clock thinking we would have started right at that time. I wish we would have. Does anybody need a bathroom break? Because we're going to go until you all are done. Well, I mean any of the attorneys. Okay, great. Let me have the, let me ask her to bring the attorney. No, just one second. If we're going to keep going, we want to make sure to keep all these objections to the other evidence before we start. Oh, okay. Sure.
the micro stamps? Yes. I'm sorry, you, you said the objections were what? I'm sorry. Judge, one, that's a different account name than is the social media uh, that identified the, on the state's exhibit as one of her social media accounts. Um, so, Judge, I object that they can't link it to a post actually made by my client to uh, the, they can authenticate that these, those comments were actually posted by uh, Ms. Geiger, uh, that anybody could have, could have posted to that. Uh, there's nothing unique about, pin, pin, other people have access to your page, and so I think, I, they need to show with certainty from forensic evidence that that is tied to, their, that there's no other way that anyone else could have posted that uh, under that name. And three, it's more, uh, it's, it's more prejudicial than probative. <clears throat> States Exhibit uh, 401 uh, page. And Your Honor, my response to that is those documents uh, were actually pulled off of the defendant's Pinterest account via search warrant by uh, Ranger and had been tendered to defense counsel in discovery uh, a long time ago. You just you have to go through and really look at what's on that. Uh, um, go through the search warrant return to find what's in there. There were almost a thousand or so images on that return, and we're only asking to offer three. So just so I'm clear, you all got a search warrant to search for the contents of Ms. Geiger's Pinterest account. Yes, Sean. And these are things that Ms. Geiger, Ms. Geiger saved to her account. Yes, sir. And they were provided to the defense. Yes, you yes, sir. Yes, sir. As part yes. of your discovery. Yes, sir. And you object that they're prejudicial. Yes, sir. The objection is overruled.
items to 353, 354, 355, and 356. Approach, Your Honor. Yes. <coughs> within that exhibit um, that uh, so I would object to those statements that other individuals made as hearsay and the uh, text responses uh, from <coughs> Ms. Geiger are uh, not relevant and more prejudicial than probative. Three fifty four judge, again there are um, <clears throat> texts that are coming into the phone that are hearsay and any responses uh, by uh, Miss Geiger with her phone, these text messages are not relevant and more prejudicial than probative. The probative value in both those exhibits is substantially outweighed by the uh, prejudicial uh, effect. In State Civit 355, the hearsay statement from Martin Rivera we, we would object, object to and the response by Ms. Geiger is not relevant and its probative value, if any, is substantially outweighed by its prejudicial value. And States Exhibit 356, there are hearsay text messages from Mark Rivera and the text responses from Ms. Geiger are not relevant and the prejudicial value, the probative value is substantially outweighed by the prejudicial value. Ms. Long? Your Honor, uh, the statements made by the defendant are statements made by the defendant that are, are not hearsay and they are relevant because the jury can consider or any uh, statements that they may consider <coughs> relevant to determining the appropriate punishment in the trial. Uh, as far as the statements made by the other individuals on the phone, those statements are not made, are not being offered for the truth of the matter. Your objections to 353 through 356 are overruled. They'll be it. Well, does anybody need a bathroom break?
statement as we begin the punishment phase? No, no. You may call your first witness. They called me Alice and John. Allison Jean, A L L I S O N J E A N. And Ms. Jean, where are you from? I'm from St. Lucia. And how long have you been in St. Lucia? All my life. What do you do in St. Lucia? I am the Chief Executive Officer for the National Utilities Regulatory Commission. It's the commission that regulates water and energy in St. Lucia. Well, I came from a single parent family. My mom um, raised three of us. I'm the eldest of the three. Um, I got married at the age of 23, and I've been married for 30 years now. I have, that's the most difficult part to say, but my, I have my daughter, Elisa. I had her before I was married. And then I had both of them 10 years later, and then Brandt. How old is Alyssa? Alyssa is 37. Okay. And when was both of them's birthday? Both of them's birthday was this past Sunday. And how old would have both of them been? He would have been 28 years old. <coughs> and how old is Brandt? Brandt is 18. And tell the ladies and gentlemen about your husband. My husband and I have been married for 30 years. That's the only husband I know. We've been, we are Christians. We worship at the Church of Christ in St. Lucia. So we have a simple life, um, one of faith, and that's how we raise our children in the church. Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, let's spend some time talking about Bolton. Can you tell them what type of student is Bolton? Both of them went to school, to elementary school in St. Lucia. At the age of 11, there's an examination that is called the Common Entrance Examination. That is what allows students to go into high school. It's a competitive um, examination. And in the year that Botham sat that exam, he ranked 23rd on the island. Um, there are about over 4,000 students who write that exam, and he was 23rd. So he was admitted to what is, re what is known in St. Lucia as the top high school. It was the St. Mary's College. During his five years at high school, Botham was very active. He was president of his schoolhouse. He was also um, the leader for several little clubs, several groups. He started a choir because he loved to sing, so he got one of his teachers to commence a choir, and he was the one leading in that choir. Was that in high school where he got the teacher to start a choir because he wanted to sing? That's right. You know what folks? Yes. Ms. John, I'm gonna show you some photos. And I'm showing you, it's been marked for evidence at Stakes Exhibit 325. 
326, 327, 328, and 329. And are these photos, are some of the photos of your son, both of them? Yes, they are. Okay. And do you think these photos would help the jury to understand your testimony as you're discussing your son? Yes, they will. Yes, this photo was <coughs> taken when both of them was vying for president of the student the school council at the Harding University. Okay. We're going to come back and talk a little bit about that, okay? Mm -hmm. And States Exhibit 326. Who was that? Yeah, that's both of them. It was at my retirement function, which the staff had for me. It was a surprise for me, but both of them was there. I worked in the public service of St. Lucia for 32 years, and I retired as permanent secretary in the Department of Infrastructure. And this is the function that both of them attended. Now, you said that you retired, uh, but we started off talking about your working again. How did that come about? That's right. I left the public service um, very early, and I now with the regulator, which is a statutory organization, so it's not a full-fledged public sector employment. In States 327. This is at Bofum's high school graduation, and he's with his grandmother. The trophy that he has in his hand was awarded to him, and it's called the Spirit of St. Mary's Trophy. This is the trophy that is given to the top student, um, and it's given for discipline, for dedication, for academic excellence, and for active um, involvement in extracurricular activities. And you say that this is his grandmother. Is she in court today? Yes, she is. I'm going to skip to state 329. That's Botham with his little brother, Brandt. We were in the Cayman Islands at the time. We were on vacation, and we were at a turtle farm. So that was Botham in the background and Brandt in yellow. So that's a photo of both of them with my daughter Lisa and her husband, Brandt, and at the time her two boys. Her two boys are my two grandsons. She now has three sons. Okay. Now let's talk a bit about <clears throat> uh, the age difference between a list of both of them. What's the approximate age difference between the three? It's so about 10 years. And how did both of them and Alyssa and Brent <coughs> interact with that age difference apart? Yeah, both of them was my middle child. And so he brought 
Alyssa and Brand together because Alyssa and Brand are 20 years apart. So he, I, I always referred to him as the glue to my three kids because he was able to relate to Ali Alyssa and bring Alyssa to Brand and vice versa. But Bofam was also, he also was this take charge type of person. So he was always giving advice both to Alyssa and to Brandt. He was, although he was the younger brother, but he treated her like he was the older brother. And it was more so because he was bigger and taller than her. <laughs> so he assumed the, the role of big brother, although she was 10 years older than him. Both of them, after high school, he also did two additional years in St. Lucia, and he also worked afterwards at a manufacturing company in St. Lucia. But his desire was to go to university in order to study accounting. Um, my preference was for him to study accounting in the, in the West Indies, which is close to where we lived. However, Bofum was a very headstrong child and he preferred to study at Harding University which was in, Ar in Searcy, Arkansas. And the primary reason I, he said to me was, it was a Christian university, it was related to the Church of Christ and he would have gotten an opportunity to continue his singing while he was at university. When both of them decided to go to Harding University, um, had Alyssa already left St. Lucia? Yes, Alyssa left St. Lucia about 18 or 19 years ago. Um, so she was already in the United States and she was a citizen of the United States then. So both of them felt that he wanted also to be closer to his sister. So that was another reason that he chose Harding University as opposed to a university in the West Indies. Was he always good with math and numbers? He was very good. He was, he was good with math, good with accounting, although I wanted him to do engineering. But he just had his head made up, and he, he really wanted to do accounting. So let's tell the ladies and gentlemen about when you took both of them to Harding. How was that experience? Yes, we visited Harding in April of 2011, I believe. It was a weekend that they had Spring Sing, um, which was a, a sort of a concert. And from the time we got to Harding University, from the time we got to the campus, both of them looked like he was already admitted. So he would just leave me seated somewhere and say, mommy, I'll be back. And he was just all over the university. He had already made friends on that, just, just that weekend. And when I saw the way he behaved on the campus, in my mind, I'm saying I cannot disappoint him. I have to find some way of getting him to Harding. Although at the time I felt that Harding was very expensive. Coming from the Caribbean, we do not have United States dollars. We have Eastern Caribbean dollars which are $2.70 to a US dollar. So it would be expensive to be able to pay in US dollars. But seeing how elated he was, I had no choice <laughs> but to accept that he would go to Harding. So as a parent, you made it possible Thank you. 
States Exhibit 333, 334, and 335. All right. Do you recognize those photos? Yes, I do. And would these photos aid you in further discussing both of them at Harding? Oh, yes. In addition to his academic studies, he was involved in the Good News Choir. It was a Good News Singers, which is a choir um, that go all over the United States singing. He was also, I think, an intern or something at the Rock House. He was involved in the youth ministry. So he did a lot of missionary type work involved in sometimes doing um, preaching, singing. He also told me that he was part of a group called Bisons for Christ, and they went to several places helping people, helping the elderly, going out and clean people's homes. Because of his IT background, he assisted elderly people in setting up their computers. He told me he had set up a computer for an elderly couple so that they could have Skype um, contact with their, their children. So he did a lot of these activities. Ms. John, you mentioned the Rock House. What is the Rock House? <laughs> the Rock House, I believe, is uh, an organization that does outreach work um, so they help other students. And he was one of those who was supposed to be encouraging the students to attend worship. So that was one of the responsibilities he was given. He was also part of the rugby team at Harding. What was that? Rugby, the oh, game rugby, rugby. Okay. yes. Yes, this is a trip that all the others who are in the photograph are students with two adults um, from Harding. So he brought these students to St. Lucia. The background is the Boys Training Center, which is a center for delinquent boys in St. Lucia. And when he brought the mission, when he brought his fellow students and, and that team to St. Lucia, they concentrated on reaching out to these delinquent boys together with an orphanage that they visited and many other institutions, but mostly institutions that had people who were at risk in some way. So the elderly home, the elderly folks' home, the orphanage, and um, delinquent boys. He concentrated a lot on serving these people. How many years did Botham and his classmates from Harding come back to St. Lucia to do mission trips? Hmm. There's so many. This long, I'm oh, sorry. Yes, oh. ma'am. How many years uh, did Botham and his classmates from Harding come to St. Lucia to do mission trips? Do you recall? They many, because he started one year after he went to Harding University, so that's um, 2012. And since then, they have come every year. Um, one year, they came, they came twice. So there seem to have been about seven or more trips to St. Lucia. And it states, is it 334? Is that just another group of... Uh, a picture of the group that was 
in Fengushan? Yes. I'm not sure if it's the same year of the first photo, but um, that's a group um, of the students that came to, to St. Lucia, and they're at a, a sky ride um, park. Um, so he lining. took them. Is it ziplining? Ziplining, that's right. Exhibit 335. Yes, that's the group that came in the spring. And both of them, together with Jake, the one with the white shirt on the opposite end of both of them, yeah. led, yes, the, the two of them led that team that year. The two adults were not there during that time. And that's a photograph taken in front of the church that we worship at in St. Lucia. Commissioner Yes. I'm showing you what's been marked for identification purposes. States exhibit three, three zero, three three one, and three three two. Mm -hmm. And are these photos of both of them? Yes. Inside? Yes. And would they aid the jury in understanding your testimony as you're giving? Oh, yes. This photo was taken about two years ago, might be 2017, but I know for sure it was taken in Jamaica, where both of them attended the annual Caribbean Lectureship of Churches of Christ. So he was a song leader, and every year the Churches of Christ meet at a, in a different Caribbean island, and this time it was in Jamaica. And so you said he was a song leader, Explain to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what his roles and responsibility were as a song leader for the conference. Yes, so because both of them sang very well, he was placed as one of the people who would be leading the congregation in singing. Um, so that Caribbean lectureship had members of Churches of Christ all over the Caribbean, the United States, in some cases, um, England, many people attend that lectureship. So both of them were selected for many years um, to be on the program for that lectureship. And I'm showing you what's been marked as state exhibit 330. Do you recall this photo? Yes. Tell us a little bit about States Exhibit 330 and States Exhibit 331. The first one with the lady is, again, one of the people that both of them reached out to in the community. Both of them found out that this lady's birthday was on the same date with mine. That was March 11th. So he went to visit her with his friends, and he, went, he just went to sing with her and just made her happy. Um, there's another photo, well, that has a cake. So he brought her a cake, and he just stayed the afternoon just singing with the group. And prior to uh, doing the mission work, did he, had he known her in the past? No. He just walked around the community and he just reached out to the people who he thought needed help. So he cleaned her backyard and then they just sat there and he just sang with her. And 
and then State Certificate 331. Uh, Ms. John, did your fund have a passion for helping others? That's right. This is actually a blind man and another person that he went to visit. And what he's doing there is singing to him. And this is also on the island of St. Lucia? It's in St. Lucia, yes. in New York with my daughter at 12.30 a.m. on September 7th when she came to inform me that she had gotten a call and that somebody told her that both of them were shot and that My life has not been the same. It's just been like a roller coaster. I cannot sleep. I cannot eat. It's, it's just been the most terrible time for me. I almost am not able to work, but I just try to busy myself just to see if it will get out of my head. But it's been very, very, very difficult. And so, since this incident has occurred, you haven't been able to go back to work? I went back to work in January of this year. But it's very, very difficult. I've been sick often, and I have to try to keep the family together because everybody's in pain. I've had to seek counseling every Tuesday. I have to get a therapist to come in and help, and I try to pray and fast and do all sorts of things just to help me get by. What about Frank? <coughs> How was the relationship between both of them and Frank uh, before September 6th of 2018? Both of them and Brandt were, had a very good relationship. Actually, Brandt spent the summer of 2017 with both of them in his apartment here in Dallas. And when Bofam was leaving, when Brand was leaving, Bofam called, crying because he didn't want Brand to leave. He felt that Brand spent three weeks with him, and the first week he said he had a lot of work to do, and he really regretted that he didn't spend enough time with Brand, and he really wanted him to stay. And how is Brent processing? I'm very concerned about him because he's just been very, very quiet. In the beginning, he was just punching down all the walls and everything, but now he's gotten quite quiet. And have you 
uh, been able to get help or counseling for her? He's been doing some counseling, but he doesn't speak much. So I'm not sure what's going through his mind. What about your husband? How was the relationship between both of them and your husband? Both of them um, again felt that he was the one to give advice. So his his dad preaches as well, and he would call his dad especially on a Sunday and they would go over the sermon, and he would also always tell his dad, like, why didn't you do the sermon this way? Why didn't you look at it from that way? And why did you use that, didn't you use that scripture? And why didn't you? So they were very close. We had a very, very close family. Very, very close. Both of them once surprised me for Mother's Day. I didn't know you was coming. <laughs> sleeping that Sunday afternoon and I heard his voice. <laughs> he used to call me Gigi. That was short for Governor General. He said I was his Governor General. And I was sleeping and I heard Gigi. And I'm like, but that's Bofam's voice, but maybe I'm dreaming. So I closed my eyes again. And he just came and lay down on me on the bed. He flew all the way from Arkansas at the time and he came to St. Lucia to surprise me. With him in Arkansas, and at one point, Melissa was in was it North Carolina. North Carolina. Yeah. How did you keep the family together when they were so far apart? I always made it my duty to spend time with all of my children. So both of them, Elisa was in the U.S., and I, sp I always spent Christmas with Alisa. And both of them came for the summer. Um, so at some point over Christmas, both of them would leave Arkansas and come to North Carolina, so we all would be together. So I would take Brand up, and we all would be together, either in New York or in Arkansas. Both um, came to Dallas to have an interview for that internship. Both of them called me crying, and I thought there was something wrong. And he said, Mom, I made it for the internship. There were 12 people interviewed, and I think they were going to be selecting six. So he was very nervous. He didn't think that he would have made it. And he was selected for the internship at PwC. And during the time he was on the internship, it was supposed to be for six weeks. But he was offered a, an extension for six months. And he was still studying at Harding then. So he was offered an extension to six months and also offer, made, gotten an offer of employment to start in June or July of the following year. So he spent six months here in Dallas from June until December. He returned to Harding in January, graduated in May, and then came straight back to Dallas in June of 2016. Did you 
ever come to Dallas to visit Baltimore? Yes, I came. I did in, in December of 2016. I came to visit Dallas. I came to visit Bofum with my mom and my nephew. And we spent three weeks with him during Christmas time. And during that time, did he have to work as well? Yes. He actually, he was working in Austin. Um, he would he would travel to Austin on a Sunday and return on a Thursday or Friday. So the first week that we spent with him, he took us to Austin. And he put us up at one hotel and he stayed at another hotel. He said it was because he didn't want us to disturb him because he was still at work. So he didn't mix business with pleasure. He stayed at one hotel and he said, Y'all are on vacation, I'm not. So, but we had a good time with him. Ms. John, when was the last time that you saw Bolton before he passed away on September 6th of 2018? I saw Bolton. On the second, third, I think it was the first, second, and third of February in 2018. I was in New York, and both of them came across to New York to visit me. His dad was there as well, so these, that was the last time we saw him. And how was that visit? Beautiful. <laughs> Again, he believed he surprised me. <laughs> he knew he was coming. Yeah. So, but he told everybody not to tell me. <laughs> but a little bird told me. So. And when was the last time you spoke with him on the phone? I spoke with him on September 5th. That was the day before. He called about 9.30 in the evening. So that's when we last spoke. And this past Sunday was his birthday? Yes, September 29th. What have you done to try to cherish his name? <coughs> and the things that he was most fond of? Yeah, all the things that both of them started, his outreach to the delinquent boys, the orphanage, the elderly home. We've started a foundation in his name, the Both of them Foundation. And on Sunday, we launched the foundation at a, ga a gala event here in Dallas. We expect out of that foundation to reach out to other people. And in addition to these institutions, we're, we've added the outreach to victims like ourselves um, to lend support to them so that they can cushion the pain that we're going through um, so that you know, we could help them in whatever way. And on Sunday, Mrs. John, how old would have both of them have been? He would have been 28 years old. So in his short 28 years, he dedicated himself to helping others? Actually, 26 years he did oh, that. Years, yeah. Because he died a few days before his 27th birthday.
confirm that the testimony they will give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. Yes, I do. Thank you very much. Yeah, proceed. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Ray, would you please introduce yourself to the jury by your first and last name? Uh, Carrie Ray. And would you please spell that for the court reporter? K-E-R-R-Y, last name Ray, R-A-Y. And Mr. Ray, uh, how did you know Mr. John? Uh, I was his coach, which is uh, basically his direct uh, boss, and then he also worked on my engagement. Okay, and now I see you speak a little fast, and so okay. the court reporter <laughs> has to take down everything that you say, so right. if you would just slow down a little bit when you speak. Sure. Now you say, so you were his coach, mm -hmm. and um, where did you coach him at? So the coach is essentially, uh, we have a line of reporting, so coach is the first level of reporting. So I coached him on just work-related matters or anything that he wanted to talk about. So I hear you say work-related matters. Mm -hmm. uh, did you work with Mr. John? I did. And uh, please tell the jurors where you guys worked. Pricewaterhouse Coopers. And Mr. Ray, um, what did what do you do for Pricewaterhouse Coopers? I am a senior manager in our risk assurance practice. So we work on, you know, basically work on controls and compliance. And what did Mr. John do at Pricewaterhouse Coopers? He did the same. He was an associate. And uh, Mr. Ray, when did you first meet Mr. John? I met Bo uh, during his internship, uh, which would have been about four years ago, four or five years ago. And what stood out to you about uh, Bo? Uh, mostly his attitude. Um, just very nice, personable. Um, lit up a room. He got along with everybody. Um, he was one of those guys when he when he started his internship. We you know immediately felt comfortable with him. And um, so you immediately felt comfortable. Was it a feeling that we have to have this guy? Oh well, for me it was definitely. And, uh, why? Please explain to the jury why you felt that way. Yeah, well, I mean, what we do is very relationship focused. So we work with a lot of different people. And not only was he very personable, he was also very sharp. And what do you mean by very sharp? Because he was, I, um, and maybe some of the jurors, what exactly do you do at Price Waterhouse? <laughs> I mean, we do a lot of different things. So when I say he was sharp, he's very intelligent. So if you think, just think about an auditor. I mean, I know most of you guys have heard that term. We're an auditor, just not, uh, we, we focus on a bunch of different regulatory and compliance matters. So it's, it's, you know, a field where you need to use your brain a lot and you need to, solve problems and he was very good at solving problems as well as working with the client and, um, and so you said that you were his coach what were you helping to coach him on All right so everybody has a coach I have a coach um, but it's it's basically just you you're developing you know I've got three or four of them and you develop them through their career so you want to encourage the things that they do very well and then you want to help them work on the things that they don't do so well and was Bo the sort of a man or employee that uh, did things well? He did things very well. Was he receptive to criticism if there was something that he might need to work on? Very. To a fault, I would say. He was, he was always looking to improve himself. Always looking to improve himself. Would you say, um, was he a go-getter? Oh, definitely. He, was, uh, he, was, he always wanted to do more. And you met him in the internship process, so at some point in time, there was an offer for employment extended to Bo. Would you please explain to the jurors how that process and discussion uh, came about? Yeah, so I mean, you do an internship, um, depending on what university or program you're in, determines when you do your internship. In his case, it was his junior year. Um, so yeah, he received an offer, you know, soon after or before his internship ended. So um, in many cases, we'll offer a full-term employment um, at the end of the internship. And as uh, employment with Price Bar Housekeeper is competitive, would you say? Oh, very. What were, um, I guess around the office, if you could help explain, what was Bo's typical day like, if there is such a typical day at Price Bar Housekeeper? Um, so there aren't a lot of typical days. Um, I guess, but a general day would be um, you know, so we'll have, so we go through different phases, but you know, a typical day might be he shows up to the office or to the client site, give me or whoever he's working for on the engagement an update, and then for the rest of the day he'll be working, you know, through his engagement. So he'll be meeting with, with clients and completing his deliverables um, so that we can deliver our work. 
And what was Bo's specialty? So, I mean, he, Bo had a, I mean, he was strong in the IT space. So, in, what? in the IT, so information technology space. Okay. So, he was very strong with applications and systems, um, and that, that's where he shined. And what about the point of sales? Yeah, so, and then that's part of the, the IT space, but yeah, so there are, there, were, there are certain engagements where we work on different applications, a POS system may be one of them, but it, that's definitely an area where I'll look to him for, for his expertise. And would you say Bo made an impact on PricewaterhouseCoopers and specifically the Dallas location? Yes and yes. Um, I mean, his impact on Dallas location was, was outsized, right? So, I mean, everybody knew, I mean, a lot of people knew Bo. Um, and anyone who knew Bo had a very high opinion of Bo. And it's just because of the type of man he was? It was the type of person he was, just his, his, uh, his almost his aura. I mean, when he came, when he, when he went to a meeting or he joined your group or whatever it was, you knew Bo. He was just big personality, nice person, big smile. Never really had a bad thing to say about anybody. Um, that's the kind of person he was. And how has his passing impacted you and your fellow co-workers at uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers? It's been rough. Um, so, I mean, I, I used to see or talk to Bo on a daily basis for, you know, three years. I knew him. Uh, I mean, our group and has had a very difficult time coming to terms. And what do you mean by that? It's just not, not <coughs> you know, not seeing him on a daily basis. Or you know, not having that that guy to lift you up. I mean, it's it's been it's been tough. And so, did he provide? Um, you said lift you up. So I'm guessing was Bo also a sense of comfort and support for me and for many others, definitely. What um, I guess when was the last time you saw Bo? Um. The, uh, Probably, I mean, the week the week he died, I, I saw him that week, um, or the week before. So I was at a conference the week he died, but we spoke every day while I was away. That's just we that that was our relationship. So he worked on my engagement. We spoke by phone, text, emails, um, and I just remember sending him a few messages on the plane while I was getting ready to take off that night. And I know by the time I landed, he was no longer with us. Bo, um, and he said, so I'm guessing work seems very important to him. Was he a person that finished his task uh, by the time that he needed them done? Yes. Bo, so Bo is a perfectionist. He's a perfectionist? He's a perfectionist. So Bo, you know, he wanted everything to be perfect. Um, so, I mean, that was just personality. He wanted it done right. He wanted it done on time. And, you know, I didn't, you didn't have to worry. I didn't worry about anything that Bo was working on. Did you see a bright and long future for him at Price Warehouse Cooper? One hundred percent. So I paid a lot of special attention to him, um, <coughs> and I, I I target several people in the firm that I want to make sure I work with and develop. And he was definitely number one on that list because I I knew he had whatever it is he wanted to do in the long term, whether it was with PwC or not, that he was going to be excellent at it. And he's going to be excellent at yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, what would you say his potential was like? <coughs> his I mean unlimited. He was. He was, yeah, I mean, he could write his own check, I think. He had his own, his own path to go. I'll pass the witness. No questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Ray. You may be excused. No objection, Mr. Ray. The state will call Robert Watson. <coughs>
Good afternoon, Mr. Watson. Uh, Sergeant Watson, you look a little different today. Yes, ma'am. But um, you are, in fact, the same Robert Watson that testified for this jury last week. Yes, ma'am. And uh, Sergeant Watson, we called you back because you were the defendant's uh, sergeant for the CRT team, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And I guess that will put you in sort of an immediate supervisor position? Yes, ma'am. And I brought you back because I wanted to ask you, in the years that you spent with as the defendant's supervisor and sergeant over CRT, did there come a time where you made an internal affairs affair referral based on some actions taken by the defendant? Yes, ma'am. And would you please explain those to the jury? It was regarding an incident where uh, Ms. Geiger had an individual in custody and um, she was by herself and the individual individual got away. He, he got up and ran away. Uh, she called for assistance and, and other officers showed up to help her. And this incident that you're referring to, did this occur in um, August of 2018? That sounds about right. Okay. And so you said it was a situation in which a individual got away. Was this a handcuffed prisoner? Yes, ma'am. And, and so did this handcuffed prisoner escape away from the defendant? Yes, ma'am. And did the defendant notify the immediate supervisor? A supervisor was on scene. He wasn't made aware that it was a handcuffed prisoner. He was not made aware? Yes, ma'am. And when were you notified that a handcuffed prisoner had escaped from the defendant? Uh, several hours after that incident had occurred. And based off of, um, at the point in time when you learned of it, you felt that this was some information that you needed to make a referral to the Internal Affairs Division? Yes, ma'am. And that this was something more than just a situation that you could do verbal counseling for? Yes, ma'am. I'll pass the witness. Sorry, Watson, how long did you supervise uh, Ms. Geiger? Whenever she started the CRT team, as I was on I was a supervisor then. Okay. Um, and overall, um, during the time that you supervised her, um, <clears throat> was she a dependable officer? Yes, she was. Uh, did she work hard? Absolutely. Um, did she come in contact with numerous violent felons on the CRT team? Yes, sir. trust her as far as her character uh, with regard to being on your team? Yes, sir. Um, with, uh, with regard to uh, this incident, it's there was a suspect that had been arrested. You know what the suspect was arrested for? I believe he had illegal narcotics on him, if I recall right. Geiger used any inappropriate force with this suspect, correct? No, sir. Um, the suspect was handcuffed and uh, somebody let their, let their guard down for a minute. And if you let your guard down, I mean for a second, then this is what should happen. The, the, the guy ran off while handcuffed, correct? Yes, sir. Now, there was efforts made to immediately find this guy, correct? The, suspect? Yes. Um, and was that what everybody's immediate attention was on? Yes, sir. Um, and a supervisor was out there, correct? Yes. Um, and the supervisor, I guess, was informed that a, that a suspect had escaped, correct? Yes. Uh, but this, the, the supervisor wasn't notified with the specific word, of course, that a handcuff prisoner had escaped, correct? Yes, sir. Um, at any time you have um, a suspect escaped, you know, especially handcuffed, uh, you're going to want a, uh, as a supervisor, it's, it's your duty to uh, inform the chain of command by, uh, by requesting further investigation, correct? Yes, sir. I mean, that's, it's, you, it's a, not, not just for disciplinary purposes, but also for training purposes, correct? Yes, sir. Um, and it, their uh, officers are in, on a daily basis, uh, a number of interactions with suspects and prisoners, and 
even though Ms. Geiger has dealt with numerous uh, violent felons, uh, your, your concern was that, okay, just we, we can't let our guard down for any second and, um, and there needs to be clear communication afterwards. Is that fair to say? Yes, sir. Is this the type of uh, violation in and of itself that would lead to serious discipline? Not that I've ever seen, sir. I'll pass away this. Briefly, Your Honor. Sergeant Watson, uh, were you on duty that day? I was not. Where were you? Were you at the I, was, I was on a day off, yes, ma'am. Okay. But there was an on-duty supervisor, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And the defendant did not notify that on-duty supervisor? True. Uh, she notified you, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And you said you found out several hours later? Yes, ma'am. Um, is there a mechanism in place to where if there... We'll strike that. When you returned to duty, uh, why did you feel it was important to make the referral instead of just do a verbal counseling? Because we're required to notify the chain of command when a, a prisoner escapes custody. And. A prisoner escaping custody, especially one handcuffed, isn't that, you know, that's a serious situation that the chain of command as well as the safety of the public need to be aware of. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. I'll pass the witness. No, no objection from the state, Your Honor. No objection. Thank you very much, Sergeant. <clears throat> Alyssa Finley. Make yourself comfortable, Miss Finley. You're still on drugs. Yeah. or what you have observed uh, with your parents since your brother has passed? Um, I know my mom, well, my entire family just hasn't been the same. My mother, um, she's different. She cries a lot. Most of the time she would call me. Um, we try our best to comfort each other, but some it's really hard because sometimes she calls me on a bad day where I'm low. Um, for Bertram, he, I would describe him as just a shell um, because it's like the light behind his eyes are off. He's, he's not the same. When you say he's not the same, uh, his attitude and his demeanor is not the same? Yes, he has always been like both of them, a bubbly type of person, um, and he's not that way anymore. He, sometimes you speak with them and he's, I don't even know if he hears. <coughs> And you currently live in New York, correct? I do. Uh, has this situation, has this caused you to go home and check on your parents more often? I call them more often. Um, yeah, I make it my duty to call my mom or text at least, you know, every day, a few times a day, um, because I know that was always a concern for her with both of them to always have contact. So. Again, even though I'm low, I would still make it my duty to reach out to her, just so that she knows that I'm okay. And how has this affected your younger brother, Brent? Brent is 
another show. Um, he has always been a quiet person, but I even now he's even more more quiet. Um, I know both them and I we've had conversations about Brant about you know bringing him out of his shell. Um, when both them visited Brant, my mom spoke of. Um, one time, both of them went into his car and he called me crying, like, oh, Brant doesn't want to do anything with me. And he felt like he let Brant down because he left. Um, so they didn't get more of an opportunity to bond. So he was very emotional about that. And so um, I don't know. I don't, I'm worried about Brent. Tell the jury a little bit more about your relationship with both of your children. You have three boys? Correct? I have three boys. And what are their, their ages? 14, 11, and 4. And how was, did they call him Uncle Bo? They called him both of them. He tried to demand that they call him Uncle, <laughs> but he, he was both of them. They are, they are they, how are they processing life without phone? Um, when I told them what happened, um, it was the 7th, it was a Friday. They just went back to school. School started the same, the 6th um, in New York. And Friday, every Friday they have a half day. So when they got home, I made them sit down and I told them what happened. Um, <coughs> Jaden, he is, he's a lot like Brant, an introvert. Um, so he cried, but he, his way of coping is, every time both of them came to New York, he would leave um, some item of clothing for Jaden. Um, so Jaden would wear even though it's way too big for him. <laughs> he would still wear it, his hoodies, um, T-shirts, he would wear them. Um, Jareem, he's 11. Jareem, now he is scared of police officers. One time I picked him up from school and he came running scared and I was scared because I thought something was wrong with him and he came into the car and he and like what's going on and he said he just saw a police officer um, and that frightened him. Um, Jordan if he walks by a photograph of both of them he would say oh there's both of them um, because both of them always used to sing with him. Jordan likes to sing even though he's four um, and both of them would always sing with him so How often would both of them come to New York to visit you? Anytime he got the opportunity. Um, and it would be <laughs> for the weirdest reasons. He always wanted a reason to come to New York because he loved New York. Um, he, when I closed on my house um, September 2017, that was a reason. So he came um, and he, I spent his birthday with him. He would come for Christmas, Thanksgiving. We always, any holiday, we tried to spend it together. And we heard your mom talk about how both of thought he was the big brother. Yes. Um, do you would you say that you spoiled him? As I as did. I think so. <laughs> he. Um, I would say I'm a little. I'm overprotective when it comes to my family, and both of them. I treated him like one of my boys, one of my children. So. Um, when he was attending Harding, he would call in the middle of the night for me to order a pizza for him and have it delivered to the dorm. So I would do it. Um, if he wanted a new phone, he would call me. I'm like, fine, I will give it to him. So, yeah. <laughs> and in fact, he was on your cell phone playing until he got a real job? For a while, up until, um, it was, yeah, 2018, he tried to convince me to add him back to it. <laughs> <laughs> He really was. Um, when I closed on my house and he came on his birthday, 
2017, um, he asked me to take him to Best Buy, so I did. And it was for him to buy me a TV um, as a housewarming on his birthday. And was Folsom very active in his church here in Dallas? He was. He was really active. He, um, he was the song leader. He, he always made it into a role in, in the church. So he was a song leader. Um, when he would visit in New York and if we sang a new song that he, wasn't, he didn't know, he would record it and go teach it back to Dallas West Church of Christ. So he was, he was very active in the church. He also taught um, the youth ministry. Um, that was on Wednesday nights. He started that as well. Yes. <coughs> Showing you what's been marked for identification purposes is State Exhibit 336 and 337. Do you recognize the people in 336? Yes. Okay. And 337 contains videos um, in which I showed you earlier, correct? Yes. And those videos uh, of both of them singing? Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. And there's 336 and 337 to the bench for the objection. Mm -hmm. No objection to uh, 336 and 337. They're both admitted. Permission of public trial? Yes. December 2012. And who's in this photo? Myself, Brent, and both of them. And this is Miss Allison's uh, three children. Three children. Yes. And Brent looks very young on this photo. Yes. <laughs> And this is State's Exhibit 337, uh, titled Bold Singing. that I want my brother back. You can just hear that voice and talk to that voice. One last time. Yeah. 
Like if I could just continue our conversation, our last conversation, just not let him hang up the phone. the objections uh, made earlier uh, as to exactly as articulated in front of the judge, we re 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 urge those objections to each exhibit at this time. All right. Those objections will be overruled. The judge, uh, permission to publish. Yes, ma'am. message, you could have met one, lol, next time. Incoming message, standing at hardwood and MLK on opposite end. Outgoing message, just push them or spray with your pepper spray in that general area. Six exhibit number 354. Again, an extraction report from the data from the defendant's cell phone. This is dated September 4th, 2018. Incoming message. Do you know what you need? A German Shepherd. Incoming message. I happen to have one for you. Incoming message. She's not very smart, but she'll love you. Outgoing message. LOL, is it your dog? Incoming message. No, no, it's your dog. Incoming message. Although she may be racist. Outgoing message. I wish I could have one, but not in this apartment. Smaller than my old one. Outgoing message. It's okay, I'm the same. Incoming message. LMAO. Outgoing message. I hate everything and everyone but y'all. Outgoing message, Ranger would be eaten alive. Incoming message, 
Ha ha, no you don't. Space Exhibit number 355. Again, this is an extraction report taken from the defendant's cell phone, dated March 9th, 2018. Text from Martin Rivera, incoming. Damn, I was at this area with five different black officers. Not racist, but damn. Outgoing message. Not racist, but just have a different way of working, and it shows. State would like to offer into evidence State's Exhibit Number 401 and State's Exhibit Number 357, 358, and 359. Tendering to Defense Counsel for objections. What was 359? 359 is uh, going to be one of the social media posts. Judge, no objection to State's Exhibit 401. The business record with a single page. That would be admitted. Uh, we object to State Exhibit 357 pursuant to Rule 901, uh, the Texas Rules of Evidence, as well as <coughs> 401 and the balancing test uh, in Rule 403. Rule. And object to State's Exhibit 358, pursuant to Rule 901 of the Texas Rules of Evidence, uh, as well as uh, under 401 and the balancing test under 403. And object, defense objects to State's Exhibit 359, pursuant to Rule 901, and that these are not properly authenticated. and under 401 and the balancing test of 403. Information of publishing, Your Honor. <coughs> yes, ma'am. All right, I'll put those. And then just one more, Your Honor. The state will also like to offer this time state's exhibit number 400, tendering to defense counsel for objection. Your Honor, State's Exhibit 400 is the uh, application processing unit records uh, for reasons stated previously on the record. Your objections are all available. And permission to publish. Yes. There you go. Yeah. State's Exhibit number 400 under business records affidavit. Our records from the Dallas Police Department and their applicant process unit. <laughs> Dated for August 23rd, 2012. <laughs> The defendant's name, Amber Geiger, preliminary interview for the Dallas Police Department. 
page 2, section 3. Question B. Have you ever applied with any law enforcement agency, fire department, or related work, including cadet or explorer? Yes or no. Circles, yes. Date and position applied, approximately June 7, 2012, to the Fort Worth Police Department. Fort Worth, denied police officer, approximately July 15, 2012, DFW Airport police officer. Page four of State's Exhibit. 400. Drug usage. A. Have you ever smoked or experimented with marijuana? Circles, yes. Number of occasions, three. First used, July 2009. Last used, June 20th, 2011. Drug usage. <coughs> Dates used July 2009, last used June 2011, first time July 2009. Second question total number of times used three. Ever bought? No. Ever possessed more than four ounces of marijuana? No. Narrative. First tried right out of high school with friends. Then in 2011, two, th two times, two X, friend's birthday. Again, dated August 23rd, 2012. <laughs> States exhibit number 357. Taken from the defendant's <coughs> Pinterest account. States, people are so ungrateful. No one ever thanks me for having the patience not to kill them. At the bottom of states exhibit number 359, Amber, smiley face, save the love to laugh, comment, grateful minion. I'm Tanya Eiser, investigative reporter here at Channel 8. I'm joined by Justin Moore, a Dallas criminal defense attorney. 
uh, some pretty controversial text messages that we've seen and Pinterest as well. Wow, yeah, those text messages are definitely working against the interest of uh, Geiger in her defense. Very inflammatory. She discusses MLK, the MLK parade a few years back. Uh, she was asked uh, when the uh, parade is over. She said when MLK is dead, dot, 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 wait a minute. Uh, she talks about using pepper spray to to move folks at the at the parade uh, back and away from uh, other officers. Um, you know, she talks about a, a racist dog and wanting one. She talks about the work habits of her black uh, police officer colleagues, all inflammatory, and they all look bad for uh, Mrs. Geiger in front of this jury. I don't know what her defense might be thinking right now. I mean, they tried to object to they those had to keep it out. Yeah, yeah, understandably so. They don't look good for her. I mean, what we've seen in this uh, line of questioning and punishment phase is we've seen the state eulogize both of John further, provide character evidence of him being a great person, an awesome uh, worker at a Price Waterhouse Cooper, uh, someone who is just a beacon to the community. But you've also seen them continue this uh, uh, this character assault of Miss Geiger. Her character is on trial, and they're really going it, going after her with these text messages. It's kind of no holds barred. It's no holds barred. It's oh my god. I mean, she they're painting her out to be worse than she looked during uh, case in chief last week. And something that uh, both of Jean's mom said, he said, she said, uh, my life has not been the same. It has been a roller coaster. I cannot sleep. I cannot eat. It's just been the most terrible time for me. How, how effective do you think the oh. testimony was? I mean, I think it's important to put yourself in the shoes of a mother who has lost a son. Um, I don't have children, but I witnessed my mom lose my brother. So the judge has left the courtroom. It looks like we're on a break. I, it yeah. wasn't really said audibly, at least that I caught. Right. Yeah, it appears so. The judge just walked out. It looks like she released the jury. It might be their afternoon break. Um, you know, Mrs. Geiger still looks like she's sitting down there. So I don't think they've recessed for the day. So we can prepare for them to come back and hear more testimony. We haven't spoken uh, since the verdict came down this morning. What was your reactions to this verdict? I was shocked, honestly. I mean, just taking the evidence as it is or as it were, I was fully expecting her to at least get a manslaughter charge. I thought the murder was going to be a tough, uh, a tough order for the uh, state to, to to get to. But I mean, they got to it. I mean, we saw a beautiful close from Jason Hermes and Jason Fine yesterday. Um, so I think what they were able to do is they were able to effectively appeal to the emotions of the jurors let them know that this type of crime, how heinous it is, it should not go without being punished. And I think they effectively laid it out and laid out the reasons why the jury should uh, find Ms. Geiger guilty of murder. You, uh, Hermes was once your supervisor. He was once my direct supervisor when I was a DA a few years back. Um, you know, incredible, incredible attorney. I mean, you saw some of the, uh, the things that he did in trial, which is, you know, he got up in Mrs. Geiger's face he appealed to direct emotion, but he also used cogent and tight logic with his arguments. These are all things that he taught us when I was a young prosecutor, and he's doing that 
in a very masterful way in this trial. It's just been a, this whole trial, the prosecution has really been on their game. Oh yeah, I mean, this is their A-team. You know, Judge Cruzo, D.A. Cruzo, he found the guys in his office, in girls, who know what they're doing. They've seen these cases. They've taken their losses, too, in previous cases, one being uh, the Derek Wiley case. And they saw what worked, and they saw what didn't work. And one thing that they saw that did work was, a, you know, fully and effectively and aggressively going after expert testimony. Expert testimony, a lot of times, that's what, you know, a lot of these not guilty verdicts come from is when you have these expert witnesses take the stand and say that officers actions were reasonable so what they did in this trial is they aggressively attacked that and made sure they couldn't get that testimony in uh, so yeah i mean the da's office they've shown that they have put in the work and the effort to get the verdict that the community asked for and they should be applauded for that because it was a tough order for them is, is amber going to have to take the stand again She's going to have to get up there and, you know, we talked about this during break. Uh, she's going to have to beg to make sure she doesn't get a full 99-year sentence. Um, I think it's not likely that she'll get a full 99-year no. sentence. Yeah. But, I mean, then again, this jury has shown that they're willing to defy convention and make the hard decision. And, you know, you can kind of talk about or you can kind of argue about the, you know, their decisions are right or wrong, but I think they're showing courage, at least going with their gut. So we don't know what's going to happen at this point. The evidence that we've seen in the punishment phase is damning for Mrs. Geiger. So, I mean, ultimately, you know, the defense is going to have a hard, a hard job or a tough job trying to get them back to, to level and look at this, uh, you know, this, uh, this evidence that's being presented to them in a way that's not going to completely put Ms. Geiger behind the eight ball. What do you think's going on here? We're watching the judge has left the courtroom, Amber Geiger's. We have see her attorneys. They're huddled around her. I yeah, think they're huddled. getting ready to put her on the stand. You think? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's what it looks like. I mean, you know, typically, you know, defense, uh, defense attorneys don't huddle around their client unless they're getting ready to put them on the stand. So I think they're talking to her, making sure she can uh, get up there and, you know, maintain her composure, touch the notes that she needs to touch because it's going to be vital for her life. So, that, you know, they want to make sure she's up to the task. It was interesting that we didn't see opening statements from either side. You know, normally in a, in a, in a punishment phase, it's kind of like the, the guilt innocence. You right. see opening statements. Why, why, why do you think we didn't see that? Well, I mean, I think, uh, you know, both sides have uh, introduced themselves to the jury. I mean, everybody's well acquainted with each side. They understand the issues already. So, yeah, it's better to not inundate them with extra, you know, stuff, so to speak, and get into the meat and potatoes of uh, the punishment phase. So I think they just decided to forego that and just started to, and they wanted to just put on evidence so they can get this uh, out of the way, and, uh, you know, move on with uh, this part of, uh, of the trial. We've had some folks who've missed the text messages. What are the key things that we saw in those text messages? Boy, those text messages, wow. Um, if there was any scintilla of You could see why they wanted to keep him out of yeah, guilt innocence. Yeah, right, right. I mean, if there was any scintilla of sympathy for Miss Geiger that the jury might have had, and the state is chipping away at that, those text messages are so inflammatory. You know, from the MLK parade text to the, to the German Shepherd and the, you know, the dog being quote-unquote racist to Miss Geiger talking about using pepper spray as, a, as an option to get... Uh, parade goers out of a, a fellow officer's way to, you know, her talking about, you know, her fellow officers who are black and their, you know, their work habits. I mean, it's just damning. All, all the way to the Pinterest account posts and the things that she liked, how she talked about shooting first and, you know, killing before being killed without provocation. It just, it just looks terrible. And I see why the defense wanted to keep that out. But, I mean, you know, they couldn't, and this was a Mack truck waiting to hit them in the face, and it's hitting them right now. Um, I, I can't imagine what they're telling Ms. Geiger right now in lieu of her taking the stand. You know, last week she owned up to her actions in that apartment. She's going to have to own up to these texts. She's going to have to own up to the Pinterest account uh, activity. I don't see how she's going to own up to it in a way that makes the jurors like her anymore. But she's going to have to do it, so I don't want to completely say it's impossible, but... She's going to have a tough road ahead of her. The uh, somebody's asking if we'll see a sentencing today. Like, if we'll see, will we uh, talk? T explain to folks just kind of how this process works. What, uh, what we're watching. Yeah. So, in, 
Well, Judge is. Oh, Judge is back on the stand. We don't have sound yet. It looks like the jury. I don't know if she's. You think she's dismissing them? We still don't have sound. The judge has made it very clear we're not supposed to. Uh, we don't get sound when they're not okay. yeah, on the court, when they're not on the record. So the judge is conferring with the attorneys. It's really impossible to know exactly why. Mm -hmm. What any thoughts on why, what they might be doing here? Uh, housekeeping measures, maybe discussing some evidentiary issues. But let's get back to what sentencing is. So. What the state is doing, they're providing victim impact statements. You've seen testimony from uh, Botham John's mother, Botham John's sister. You've seen testimony from his supervisor at PricewaterhouseCooper, all detailing how great of a person he was. He was a benefit to the community. So that's what the state is doing. So that we call that we call that uh, aggravating evidence for the defendant. They want to show the jury that Ms. Geiger took away someone who was deserving of still being here, someone who never should have had this happen to. So that's what they want to do. That's uh, They're pulling out the emotional heartstrings of the jury. What Pretty the effectively. Effectively. What the defense is trying to do is they're trying to provide mitigating factors. They haven't really gotten into it yet because we're still going through the state's evidence, but they're trying to get them on rebuttal and trying to minimize the damage. I don't know if they're effectively doing that. Oh, also another thing, they had Sergeant, I believe it was Sergeant um, Watson, Watson on, her CR, Ms. Geiger, CRT supervisor. His testimony was important because it shows that her propensity of telling the, telling the truth, her, her propensity for mendacity um, is in question because she lied about an issue that he had to refer to internal ref affairs a few years back when it came to a handcuffed suspect actually fleeing away from her and her not reporting it to her supervisor. So when she takes the stand, the jury is going to take that into account. Can we actually listen to her testimony and is find it truthful? Right. You know, so I mean, you know, it's, it's character evidence that's really going to um, hurt her going forward. I mean, they have a tough road. I mean, you know, going into to today after the verdict was rendered, we thought that her defense counsel should be able to effectively convey to the jury that she didn't deserve a maximum sentence. Um, it's still going to be tough to get that 99 years. I'm sure the state's going to ask for it because they're hitting her pretty hard with this evidence. Um, but you know, I know we opined before and a few other folks said that she might have a five to 10 year sentence. With each damning piece of evidence, you're going to add some more years to that, I suppose. So, um, and it which also goes to another issue if she gets the appeal bond or not. Right. Well, no, we, we know oh, she she's won't be not, able to get it. Oh, yeah, right. Get the, yeah, that law what, changed. We haven't talked about that. Yeah, that uh, law changed. There was a change in the law. To explain to folks this change in the law that we all, everybody in the legal community is finding out about today, it seems like. Right. So the change occurred in 2017. So typically, if a person would have had a sentence under 10 years, they would have had the, uh, the ability to get an appeal bond in which they would not be taken into custody and they could wait out their appeal within the comfort of their own home. Um, that law changed in 2017. So she will not be afforded that opportunity. So, you know, at the end of this punishment proceeding, she's going to have to go you know, or be taken into custody and she's going to have to wait out her appeal while in custody, uh, which is a complete difference of what the standard used to be. Um, I don't know why the Texas le legislature made that change in 2017, but they did. And, uh, you know, we're seeing this being played out with Ms. Geiger. She won't be afforded that, uh, that ability to go home like other defendants have in the past. Yeah, it's, it's kind of surprising that nobody seemed to know about it until today. I mean, everybody right. I talked to really thought that that was the rules. And some somewhere along the line, well, we know it, it changed in, on January 1st of 2017. There was a change right. made. And maybe it's just because typically in murder cases and cases of this type, yeah. you wouldn't typically get less than 10 years. Right, so it's yeah. not really an issue that arises that often. And that, it doesn't really arise. I mean typically in murder cases folks don't get less than 10 years I mean you think about it you've, they've already proven that it was an intentional murder there was mal you know there, there was mens rea involved there so typically you see folks they don't even get close to getting a sentence under 10 years but with this situation you have an officer it's been considered because she's been classified as someone who has been a credit to the community in the past so I think we just readily assume that it was a possibility that she would get a sentence under 10 years so that's why we thought about it um, but, you know, ultimately, and it's hard, it's always hard to keep up with legislative ch uh, changes of the legislative landscape. Um, so a lot of times that slips uh, past a lot of attorneys. 
Uh, but here, I think we were, uh, we're educating folks right now. I mean, I was talking to somebody the other day, like co covering this case is almost like a CLE, continuing legal education course, because we're picking up on small little nuances that only would come up in a case like this. Right, mistake of fact and mistake of all fact, these right. issues that we wouldn't normally talk about. Or the issue of uh, her possibly raising this uh, defense of, uh, of uh, what is the defense? I'll read it from the statute. At the punishment stage of a trial, the defendant may raise the issue as to whether he or she caused the death under the immediate influence of sudden passion arising from an adequate cause. What's important about that is if the defendant proves the issue in the affirmative by preponderance of the evidence, the offense is a felony of the second degree. So, I mean, if they can effectively raise this issue, we might see the punishment get pushed back down to a second degree felony which would get, make her eligible for, paro, uh, for probation. But who would make that decision? The jury would. The jury would make that decision. Um, and from what we've seen, this jury is pretty, uh, pretty gung-ho. If they wanted to go as a second degree, they could have gone. They could have done song. that. Yeah, they could have done that during uh, guilt or innocence. But, you know, you never know with these uh, punishment phase uh, issues. That's why it's part of the statute. Um, you know, it's still a caveat there for defendants to kind of latch on to as a last-ditch effort to keep them out of prison so I don't think the legislature would have put that in there if it wasn't a possibility um, it's going to be I think it's a long shot for this case but nevertheless it's still a possibility and you're going to see our defense team try and um, use that argument going forward. What do you think the key factors were that that made the jury go okay she's guilty of murder what what what, what were the things that made them say okay this is the appropriate conviction it's really hard to say. I don't know what they were deliberating on back in the back in the jury room. Um, but I'll say this. I mean, the state's closing argument was just compelling. I think it was more compelling than the defense. You know, typically the defense, they just have to poke holes in the state's theory. They don't have to really provide some, you know, groundbreaking, uh, you know, a piece of evidence that will, you know, save their client because ultimately the burden is on the state. But I think what the state was able to do with their fabulous prosecutors is they're able to really paint Ms. Geiger as someone not deserving of, uh, of leniency, right? I mean, Mr. John was in his home eating ice cream on a Thursday night watching football, and he was murdered in cold blood. We can call it murder now because she's convicted of it, she right? She is convicted. And I think really, in, you know, you saw Jason Hermes kind of just nail this point on the wall. That's inexcusable. There's nothing that you can say to excuse that. You know, she tried to use this whoops defense, which was the mistake of fact. But I just think the jurors were, you know, they came to the conclusion that that's not good enough. You know, we got to be safe in our own home. So I think that's really what it hinged upon. Well, and, and if they had agreed with mistake of fact, then you would have had the castle doctrine kind of turned on its head. Right, right, precisely, precisely. The castle doctrine would have came into play, but you know, I think for one, those are two confusing issues for the jury, and they might have worked it all the way through, and they probably said at the end of the day, these issues are nebulous and confusing, and it's too cloudy for us to even go to that part of the argument for the defense. Let's stay somewhere where we're sure of, which is this is inexcusable. It might not be a cogent legal argument, but at the end of the day, that's why you have folks from the community serve on these jury panels, because they bring some type of logic and common sense that a lot of times us lawyers don't think about. We think about we think about things in a very nuanced and very you know closed off type of way. Almost a lot of times devoid of common sense. It's all based on case law and precedent, which might might not take into effect um, the ethos of society that's going on at the moment. The social you know, the social milieu that's currently permeating through a community. A lot of times we look at things devoid of that, but you got these community folks coming in. They understand how they feel and how they would feel in that position. And they probably made a decision saying that if I were Botham Jean, I would want this person to be held liable for murdering me in my home. And I think that's where the decision basically ended up coming from. So we've been watching here in the courtroom, uh, one, of the the prosec one of the prosecutors was talking to Botham's family and it's kind of confusing what's going on. The jury's yeah, not in there. We can't really tell. Are they wrapping up for the day, or it's kind of it's really hard to say. And with them having the mics off, and again, that's something that the the judge has made very clear uh, that 
they we cannot have mics on when the court is not on the record, not in session. Uh, someone's asking me, will she get to go home today? No, she, no, she won't. She's been convicted. She does she, not get to go home. She is a convicted murderer. She will be going yeah. to Lou Starrett tonight. And uh, she'll be booked in, and and there will be booking video of that. Right, right. That's going to be compelling to see too. We already have one booking video of her um, from Kaufman County, right? Kaufman when she was County. booked on the manslaughter charge. Right. This is all. This is all remarkable, Tanya. I mean, this is something that we've never really seen before. I mean, we've seen it sporadically in certain pockets of uh, the country. We've seen certain officers. Well, we've had two convicted in Dallas County. Oh, yeah. Well, Roy Oliver I mean, and... And Ken Johnson. Yeah. This certainly is true. the first female right. officer. That's certainly extraordinary. Right. And I think that's across the country. We haven't seen a female officer get convicted of... Uh, no, this, of murder this yet. isn't. And of course, the facts of this case were, were extraordinary as well. I don't, I don't think anybody that I know can recall a case like this. Right. I mean, yeah. Just the fact pattern. The fact pattern is wonky. This is something that you see in law school. This is the fact pattern that your law professor thinks up of, uh, you know, in lieu of a, of a semester starting, wanting to be cute. This is, a, this is a fact pattern that's very bizarre. It's a lot of issues here that you got to kind of, you know, be creative about. And kudos to the attorneys on both sides for coming with arguments that actually made sense. Um, you know, you can tell they tried hard on both ends. Um, but yeah, to your point, this is something that we've never seen before. Do you think this will be taught in law school? Uh, well, so this issue is going to be taken up on appeal. So if it gets to an appellate court and we get a decision that um, sets a new precedent, it will be taught. But as of right now, I don't see this being something that a professor is going to really teach in law school. Uh, at least not in a criminal law course. Well, so that guy right there, that's uh, that's Mike Mola. He's the appellate attorney for Amber Geiger's team. Mm -hmm. What do you think they will be bringing up in an appeal in this case? Uh, the issue of the expert testimony being restricted. Um, I think change of venue, probably. Cha you know, change of venue. Um, you know, some of the text message issues. Uh, honestly, I think the expert testimony issue is something that's going to be brought up because, from the Sixth Amendment perspective. Every defendant should be able to provide the defense that they find to be um, appropriate for their, uh, for their case or for their trial. And the fact that judge restricted that expert testimony, I can see her attorneys using that as an appealable issue going forward. Why Will it be an it? effective issue? It's hard, to, it's hard to say. I mean, the, you know, the Texas Criminal Court of Appeals, you know, those folks are elected too. You don't know how they're going to sway on that. I mean, politics they're is still going to be involved in that too. Well, and, courts and, and appeals courts are loath to overturn trial judges. They're loath to overturn they not, trial not judges. Not to say they won't, but they're but loath it, to do in it. situations where a defendant is saying that they weren't provided the, every opportunity to, to present their defense, appeal courts or appellate courts have always, well, not always, but have typically ruled in the defendant's uh, um, favor on those on those issues because you want to maintain their Sixth Amendment right to an adequate defense. Do you think they'll bring up change of venue? That she lost change of uh, Well, you know, it was rumored that, you know, some of the jurors said they had their minds made up um, before uh, the trial started, which speaks to the, the venue issue. Some uh, of the jurors that were picked? Yeah, I mean, that, that's the rumor. That's, uh, you know, that's the rumor that I'm hearing. It hadn't been substantiated, but if that is true, you know, even if it was just a rumor, I can still see her defense team raising that as an issue. They're going to give the whole kitchen sink defense when it comes to that appeal. So, you know, it could be an issue. It might be something that doesn't have any teeth to it, but you can see them just trying as hard as they can to keep Ms. Geiger out of prison. Uh, somebody's, uh, John Fuel's asking to explain why she, uh, well, he was saying could, if I it went too fast, but basically she can't get probation. Explain why. Well, she can't get probation right now because she's not eligible for probation. Right. Her charge does not provide any opportunity for it to be probated. But as we talked about, if she raises this uh, this defense or this issue, um, and the issue was, what do we call it? Issue as to whether she caused the death under the immediate influence of sudden passion arising from an adequate cause. If she raises that and the jury finds it to be something that uh, uh, is justified, her murder charge could be taken down to a second degree felony, which would make her eligible for probation. I just, that seems so unlikely it seems unlikely but I mean it's in the uh, it's in the statute so it's something that she can argue for well, sure I, and frankly until you brought it up I had no idea that existed yeah appreciate it thank you so much 830 830 830 9
not saying it's likely. I'm not saying it's unlikely. But as a defensive team, you gotta you gotta know your statute so you can uh, adequately a adequately represent your client. Is it looking like wrapping up for the day? That's what it looks like. It looks to me like they're saying either 8:30 or 9:30. All right, they're wrapping up for the day, and it would appear so. They're gonna get into Any more testimony tomorrow. You think the prosecution was done? I don't know. I don't know. We haven't gotten word yet. Um, I would assume so because when you saw Ms. Geiger's attorneys huddling around her, it seemed as if they were prepping her to take the stand again. So it seems as if uh, the state might have been finished. Um, it's so hard to tell because we don't have mics on the uh, council tables. Um, I think there's only mics on the jury box and on the witness box. So it's really kind of hard to get a, a clear understanding of some of the stuff that goes on or that that's been going on. But if I would have to guess, I think the uh, the state rested their uh, their portion of uh, of testimony for punishment. Yeah, we didn't. They didn't say it. All kind of happens so quickly. Now we've There's gone back seal. to the state of Texas seal. You think they're taking Amber Geiger into custody right now? Maybe. I I would assume so. I wish we could get a shot of that, um, but. I don't think she's being released uh, to go home tonight. So I no, think, I think no. she's going into loose there. I think they're taking her into custody. I think she's going to go back into the vestibule, which is between the courtroom and the hallway. They're going to talk. Uh, her attorneys are going to talk to her. They're, gonna, they're going to discuss what's going to happen tomorrow. And then uh, she'll be taken into custody and she'll spend the night in loose there with the thousands of other unfortunate souls that we have in this uh, in this county spending the night there, too. So. You think you think they're uh, we're gonna put her in protective custody or something like that? Oh yeah, she won't be in Gen Pop, general population. She won't be there. I mean, it's too dangerous. Uh, they'll have her in you know an isolated cell. Um, she won't be around anyone that could uh, cause her harm, because I'm sure there's a lot of folks in uh, Loose there that uh, might not find it to be uh, you know something that they would like to have with a, with an officer uh, in jail with them tonight. Well, let's just kind of recap today. Uh, so, Amber Geiger this morning found guilty of murder. The judge, the, the jury had two options. They could have convicted her of murder right. or manslaughter. They came back after six hours. They deliberated four hours yesterday, two hours today. Came back around 1045 this morning with that verdict of murder. Uh, now we've seen about four or five witnesses. We've seen his mother, we've seen uh, his sister, we've seen his supervisor, mm -hmm. uh, her, uh, Amber Geiger's supervisor, and uh, some emotional testimony th uh, this afternoon. And of course, some text messages and some Pinterest uh, that really kind of provides the contrast between these two people. Yeah, damning, damning evidence, those text messages and that Pinterest uh, activity. I don't know how Amber Geiger's team is going to get over that. It's just, it looks terrible. What they want to do in punishment, and I think what they were looking to do is to provide character uh, uh, evidence and testimony that made her more sympathetic. But what the state provided, I think it, I think there's more stuff that's being piled on her. Um, so they're going to have a tough time trying to come up with uh, something that makes her likable tomorrow. Um, I just don't see it. I mean, I think the murder conviction that we got was based on her likability or unlikability um, and you know the state is just you know Facebook said face they didn't like when I said that but, but well, wh why do you say that well I mean I you know I think it's just what we've seen is it's a circumstantial evidence case so when you have circumstantial evidence it really boils down to who you like the most because it's really hard to say what happened in that room because there's two honest. people that know one's dead one's dead and the, and the only person here to tell what happened is someone who's not likable She's not believable, based on those text messages and her and her uh, supervisor's testimony today. There's no reason to believe her. Even he doesn't believe her. Um, at least in that incident that he referred her to internal affairs, because he could have chosen to have more private counseling with her, but he chose that internal affairs is more appropriate. Why jump all the way to that if you feel like your uh, your officer doesn't have uh, uh, the propensity of telling the truth? Well, I will say that when a handcuffed prisoner gets away from an officer, that almost always triggers an internal affairs situation because that's a 
it's a big problem when right. a handcuffed prisoner gets away. But True. she didn't tell her supervisor, and that is and a I problem. Think, and I think that's what he said. That's why he retur uh, referred it to internal affairs, because she didn't tell him about it. Um, but so, and, you know, they're going to have a tough time. I think, like you said earlier, uh, or like we talked about earlier, what the state is continuing to do is to make Amber Geiger seem to be a monster, and they're just continuing to hone in on that. I'll, I, I can only imagine what Ms. Geiger and her team, what they're going to present tomorrow. You probably can expect testimony from her mother. Um, you're going to expect testimony from Ms. Geiger. Um, I don't know who else they can put on the stand. Um, you know, you have some of her uh, CRT team mem team members. You can't put them on. Martin Rivera, I think he's a wash. Not a wash, but he's probably the worst witness they can well, put on. Well, that would be a whole different set of right. problems for them. And right, I don't know exactly. that they really want to go back down that path. Right. What I'm really curious and interested to know is how is she going to explain those text messages? I mean, she... She they owned, do look bad. She, no owned up, she owned up to that activity in the, uh, in the apartment last week. She owned up to that. But how is she going to own up to these text messages? I mean, it's, it just doesn't make sense. This whole MLK thing, oh, the, the parade's going to end when he dies. How insensitive is, is that? Or talking about her black uh, you know, officer colleague saying that uh, their work habits to, to, to are, are below standard casting this uh, this racist trope that black people are lazy. I mean, I just don't get it. And I see why her team fought so hard to keep that evidence out, because it's completely damning. Right, because they originally wanted to get it into the guilt and innocence oh, yeah. portion of the trial. Yeah, Jason Hermes tried out. to sneak it in, and that's when you saw uh, Mr. Rogers, her defense attorney, immediately pop up and ask for a sidebar. Um, and now it's getting in, and it's not helping her. How important do you think the, the ice cream and the red rug was? I mean, a lot of times, you know, in trials, you're telling a story, right? So you have these, you know, these symbolic, you know, like symbols that symbolize something greater than what you actually see mm -hmm. in the text of a, of a story. These things represented something that I think truly uh, affected the jury in a very visceral way. The ice cream. It signified just the humanizing, you know. I'm sitting at home eating a bowl of ice cream. Right, yeah. I mean, we all have we, we all we all have long days. I mean, you talk about your long days throughout this course of the trial. You just want to get home and decompress. A bowl of ice cream is so symbolic. It's so, it makes it made both of John seem innocent. And he, I mean, he is innocent. But I mean, that bowl of ice cream, the red doormat. I mean, it's those things really. I believe affected the jury in a way in which they said we cannot let Miss Geiger um, get away with uh, you know not having a conviction for this uh, this uh, this incident well and she had tried to contend this whole this mistake of fact thing and then there was all this testimony from neighbors who said they went to the wrong apartment and this that and the other but basically what, what do you think it came down to on that when the jury started considering all that testimony Honestly, I think they might have conceded that she made a mistake, but I think how she responded to that mistake, that's what the jury honed in on. Because you can make a mistake and go to the wrong apartment, and we've seen numerous folks testify to that. But once she got to that apartment and she saw who was in there, I think that's what they're judging her on. If both of them, John, had been somebody else, had he been a, a, of a different race or, or of a different gender, would she have, would Ms. Geiger would have, would she have pulled a gun or a weapon and shot him I don't know I think the jury said that she probably wouldn't have and the reason why she did shoot him was because he's black and male I think that's what the jury and we haven't we haven't spoken with the jury but I think that's what it came down to had both of John been somebody else of a different gender and race he probably would not be here today and I think that's what the state honed in on and I think that's what they played with I don't want to say play with because it makes it diminishes the seriousness of it but that's part of their argument and that's how they were, uh, were able to be effective and getting the jurors to have an emotional connection with this case. The, um, the issue of her police training, how critical do you think that was to the jury? Well, you saw Jason Hermes, and I think he did, a, he did a fabulous job in kind of just detailing training and the importance of it, because um, he, he's a former police officer. So I think the reason why he was so able to talk about training in a way that was kind of almost second nature to him is he has been trained. So he talked about, you know, the observational training that an officer has, especially someone for the, with the, that, that worked in the CRT team. He talked about how an officer is, is, is trained to have 
some, some sort of awareness that's different from a lay person. Training was important because although she thought she made a mistake into going into her own home, she has been trained to be aware of things that the average citizen isn't. Right. You can't turn that off. Right. right? It's part of, it's just part of who she is. They're going to be taking us live here in a few minutes on uh, our 430. Nick, do we have an ETA on that? 60 seconds. Okay. okay. So we're going to be kind of right. kicking it off again for the folks that are watching okay. us on TV and, and uh, we'll just kind of chit chat until yeah, we go sure. live. Yeah. Um, Justin, how long have you been practicing law in Dallas County? Since 2013, so I guess it's seven years, approaching mm -hmm. seven years, yeah. You think you approach things a little differently than, a, than a, an attorney with more years? Uh, possibly. I mean, I guess it's hard to say. Um, I think maybe, maybe a fresh, fresher perspective? It's a fresher perspective like for sure. Like me. I mean, you got to realize when I became an attorney, I think uh, the George Zimmerman trial that happened that summer when I was preparing for the bar exam, um, you had some of the air, you had the Eric Garner issue. That's when uh, a lot of these police uh, shootings were becoming viral. So I was definitely, I definitely come from that, uh, that social milieu of looking at things a bit differently. Um, so yeah, I would say so. And I'm not saying that, you know, folks of an older generation. Okay, we are about to go live. I'm joined here today with Justin Moore, uh, who is a local criminal defense attorney. We've been talking about this trial. Uh, a lot of events this morning, Justin, we saw Amber Geiger convicted of murder, and now we're in the punishment phase. What do you think uh, we can expect over the next day and a half or so? Well, so what did we see today? We saw evidence that continued to malign Ms. Geiger's character. Text messages, inflammatory text messages, Pinterest activity that showed that she had some type of disregard towards people of color. Pinterest activity that showed that she was a shoot first officer and think, uh, you know, think second. So we're going to let's talk about some of those text messages, right. though. They're going to they're going to show them on the screen. Th those text messages, those MLK text messages. What's the issue with those? Well, so it shows her approach to handling issues. So conflict resolution solution is key for officers, right? So if, it show, if you have any type of indication that you harbor implicit bias, and in this situation, it shows that her bias isn't implicit at all, it's actually explicit bias. I think it shows that, you know, how she might have entered Botham John's apartment, her type of mental state might have involved how she felt about black people. That's she what talked those, about MLK being dead and, and right. some derogatory messages. And then there were also some other messages about the work ethic of black police officers. Of her black colleagues. She said it was something to be desired for. Um, it, it's just so bad for her. Um, I don't know how her team is going to overcome these text messages. And not just the text messages, the social media activity. And on top of that, then you had you know, the state eulogize Mr. John further. I, it was, I, I was almost brought to tears watching his mother testify. Yeah, his mother said, oh my, uh, God. His mother said my life has not been the same. It has been a roller coaster. I cannot sleep. I cannot eat. It's just been the most terrible time for me. Right. I mean, if, if, if you've ever experienced losing somebody close to you like that, you understand how visceral and how emotional that is. And the fact that she took the stand and was able to effectively um, explain that to the jurors that juxtaposed or going against uh, Ms. Ms. Geiger's continued um, you know, display of not having some sense of uh, uh, compassion and understanding for people of color. I think it's just, it's going to be tough for her. It's going to be tough for her. Does Amber Geiger take the stand? Yes. She has to explain those text messages. This whole entire trial from guilt innocence up until now has been Ms. Geiger having to explain away not only her mistakes, but her disposition in general. She's gonna have to explain why she seems to be predisposed towards not liking people of color. She's gonna, have to, she's gonna have to explain that. And those text messages weren't a mistake, so she can't use the mistake of fact defense for those, te those text messages. And the defense kept them out of, they were successfully kept them out of guilt innocence. Right. There's a reason why. Right, they were successful at keeping it out, but ultimately that didn't even matter because she still got convicted of murder. But I think right now, 
they're trying to make sure she doesn't go to prison for a very long time. And those text messages, they're not helping her at all. Okay. Thank you, Justin. We're going to toss back to Jason Wheeler. All right, uh, Tanya, thank you for that uh, discussion there. You can watch live coverage of the sentencing phase. Okay, so we're, st are we, uh, Nick, are we still on? Okay, we're still on regular Facebook, okay. All right, and then we're gonna be doing it again at five, actually. Right. They want us to talk at five about the appeal bond, whether or not she can get an appeal bond. Um, okay. So l while we're kind of waiting on that, let's talk about that. Um, throughout the last few days, attorneys had come on here and had said that, uh, if she got less than 10 years, she could get an appeal bond. We found mm -hmm. out today there was a change in the law. In January of 2017, the legislature changed the law. All right. She can't get an appeal bond. She can't get an appeal bond. So, I mean, it's as simple as that. She will be spending her time during the appeal in prison, um, whether it's uh, a local county jail or it's actual prison. So, um, you know, that's going to be tough for her because a lot of times on appeal you want to be able to you know, go home and go to the comfort of your confine and kind of fight it out from there, especially since she's on bond. But, you know, the Texas State Legislature made a decision back in 2017 that they're not going to afford defendants who have been convicted of murder the ability to uh, be out on appeal bond because they find them to be threats to the, uh, threats to the community. Um, and I think there's arguments on both sides. I think there is an argument that Ms. Geiger is a threat to the community not just from we saw from what we saw in guilt or innocence, but from what we saw today. Mm -hmm. um, she showed a, a predisposition towards being aggressive towards people of color. If, um, you're, if you're her and you get on the stand, what do you say? I don't know. I've, I don't have a predilection towards being aggressive towards you know, people of color or people who uh, are white or whatever. I don't have that. So I don't know how to explain that away. Um, and the fact that it's been laid to bear in front of not only the jury, but uh, to the entire country, she's gonna, ha she's gonna have to take the stand and own those text messages and make the jury feel as if, uh, you know, she's had a come to Jesus moment and she didn't feel that way anymore. And I mean, I think that's, per you can be perfectly rehabable. I mean, I've seen folks who have, ha have harbored intense racial animus have come to Jesus moments and not harbor those feelings mm -hmm. anymore. So I'm not saying she's completely outside of being rehabbed, but she's going to have to show that she's been rehabbed within this past year, right? which I don't know if she can. So if folks out there have questions for uh, Justin while we're, while we're still talking, it, I'll try oh to keep up with them uh, as your, these comments are rolling really quickly. And so I'm doing the best I can, but um, you mentioned earlier another provision in the law that, that I did, was not aware of. Mm -hmm. I would be shocked if it comes into play, but right. we can walk folks through that. All right, yes. Yeah, it comes from the Texas Penal Code. It's the murder statute, 1902, not to get too uh, technical, but I think it's important that we talk about it. So Amber Geiger has been convicted of murder, and we've been hearing all day that the punishment for murder is 5 to 99 years without the possibility of probation. Mm -hmm. However, there is a caveat in that statute that arises in the punishment stage, and I'll read it from the statute. At the punishment stage of a trial, the defendant may raise the issue as to whether he or she caused the death under the immediate influence of sudden passion arising from an adequate cause. If the defendant proves the issue in the affirmative by a preponderance of the evidence, the offense is a felony of the second degree. Why is that important? A second degree felony provides the opportunity for a defendant to get probation. And also the maximum punishment for a second degree felony is 20 years. So it would be two to 20 years, which puts us back in that manslaughter punishment range. So if she can effectively make the argument that her actions comported to what the statute states, she might be you know, serving a punishment that's more equivalent to a, a manslaughter conviction as opposed to a murder conviction. She'll still be convicted of murder. She'll still be a convicted murderer but she'll be serving the punishment as if she were convicted of manslaughter. Well, I just got a, a Facebook message. Uh, one of our producers uh, just texted me a, a, a tweet that Pete, has, Pete Schulte has sent out that uh, he's obviously a well-known local uh, defense attorney who, uh, who, has text, who has sent out that, as expected, Amber Geiger was just taken into custody by the Dallas County Sheriff's Office. 
due to her conviction for murder, she no longer has a right to be free on bond. Judge did not allow media to film or have anyone in the courtroom while it happened. Jury done for the day. So that must have been when they right. went to that Texas seal. Why do you think the judge didn't want that filmed? I mean, judge knows that this case is being covered by every media outlet in the country. And also she wants to show some sense of compassion. I mean, every judge I've ever come, uh, come across, they've always, from what I've, the judges from what I've uh, come across, they've always told each uh, person who's been convicted that they wish them luck in their lives and they want them to actually be rehabbed. So I don't think she wants to pile on and, you know, she doesn't want to pile on and humiliate, and to humiliate Ms. Geiger. She wants to kind of show some compassion and uh, make sure that uh, some of these more um, humiliating moments for her aren't being uh, broadcasted uh, on every media outlet across the country. Somebody was asking, uh, how much time do you think Amber Geiger will get? Uh, that's a question for the jury to uh, uh, decide. Um, honestly, I know we kind of guessed at it earlier, and you know I hate guessing at these things because almost we're playing with people's lives. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if she got 20 to 25 years. I know some other folks said five to, to 10. Um, I was watching some coverage today. They were saying that the state was going to ask for 50 years. Um, I don't know. With what's coming out in the state's uh, presentation of evidence and punishment, it's really hard to tell what's going to happen. Just like we didn't know if she was going to be convicted of murder or not. That wasn't a slam dunk. So I don't think punishment is going to be a slam dunk. It'll be interesting to see. Do you think, uh, did you get get a sense if the prosecution's done here for the day? Are they done presenting witnesses? Are we starting with the defense tomorrow, you think? I think so. The, the last witness they put on was... It was... Hold on. It wasn't... It wasn't Botham's sister, I don't believe. Well, they, no, they didn't... The last witness was this, was his sister, but then we, we got into the text messages right. and... Pinterest, and then that's when, ah. and that's when it kind of right. stopped. So, so I think that I think they are finished presenting evidence. From what I've known about the case, that's probably the most damning piece of evidence that they have. Do they need to do anything else, really? No, I think they put on their best evidence to show that she needs a lengthy sentence. Um, so I think they might have uh, finished presenting evidence today, and we're probably going to get into defense uh, in their presentation tomorrow. You think they start with Amber? Yeah, yeah, they started with Amber and Gild Gilda, Gilda Innocence. They need to start with her tomorrow. Um, they start with her, then they just kind of lay out uh, piece by piece certain elements from different witnesses that humanize her. So you're probably going to hear from her mother, maybe hear from some folks that she worked with. Um, I don't know what her community involvement was outside of being a police officer. I don't know if she was active in her church. It's almost going to be like a, if you've ever seen a, uh, you know, like a probation uh, hearing. Um, you know, you have folks from the community basically attesting to, you know, the defendant's good character. Um, so you're going to just see folks from the community making an appeal that she doesn't deserve a long sentence. Some folks are wondering, Justin, are you married? Ah, no, I'm not married. I'm not married. Well, there's some ladies out there that are, <laughs> that are commenting a lot. Yeah. Um, so uh, somebody asked, uh, can, you, can the judge change what the jury decides? Can the judge change what the jury decides? Mm -hmm. No. So they elected to go to a jury. Um, you could you could either elect to go to a judge or to a jury. Uh, Ms. Geiger elected to go to a jury, um, so the the decision is going to you know lie with their decision. To, uh, probably tomorrow, I would I would say. And uh, somebody wants you to explain the appeals process. The appeals process. So after punishment, they'll have 30 days to uh, file an appeal, and you'll go through the appeal court, appellate courts. Um, so. You know, it's, it's not going to be it's not going to be heard in front of this judge. It's going to go down to the uh, Texas Criminal Court of Appeals, um, and they're going to contend with that issue. Um, you know, some of the issues are appealable, so I don't think we're going to be done with this case. I think uh, it's a good possibility that it's going to get overturned and going to be sent, sent back down to the lower courts. Um, somebody else asked, "Will Amber Geiger be wearing, in other words, everyday clothes tomorrow?" Uh, to court, yeah, I think they'll pro provide her the opportunity to change clothes. That would be un it would be unusual. Typically, yeah. whenever you have yeah. a situation like that, they don't put well, the defendant it'll prejudice, in. Right. It'll prejudice the it'll prejudice the defendant. I'm sure she won't be in shackles. She might be in you know foot uh, feet shackles or foot shackles, but she won't have handcuffs on because it's going to be a bad 
image for the jury to see. So that, you know, the judge doesn't want to prejudice uh, Ms. Geiger at this moment. Let's see, I'm continuing to kind of watch these questions as they roll across the screen. No more marriage questions, okay? <laughs> It, it, it was I'm asked sure my a mom lot. Is, I'm sure my it mom was, is watching this. It was asked a lot, and I was like, well, what the yeah. heck, Abby? You know, we got time. Yeah, Mama um, Moore is watching this, and I'm sure she's going to ask me too. So this morning when you uh, when you heard the verdict, um, just what were your thoughts on that? I was at a loss for words. Um, I mean, just talking to other colleagues in the space, we kind of talked about how hard of a, a case this was for the state. Uh, there wasn't a lot of evidence there. Um, and also, I mean, in any criminal case or any criminal trial, the burden of proof is so high, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. That means any scintilla of doubt. If you think, oh, that's plausible, or that could be uh, something that, that could have happened, which occurs in almost every situation in our lives, that means a conviction should not occur. But we, all, we, all, we also know that the criminal justice system doesn't operate in that manner. That's why you have a lot of folks who have been convicted of crimes they haven't committed. I'm not saying that Ms. Geiger falls into that category because she admitted to intentionally killing both of them, John. Uh, but outside of that, I mean, I just felt that manslaughter was more appropriate um, from, a very, from a legal perspective. Um, I thought that was going to be something that the jury probably would have made a decision on. But like I said, I mean, you know, the jury said that the legislature with how they've written the statute is incorrect. A case like this deserves a murder conviction. And I'm more than comfortable uh, with uh, providing or, you know, deferring to a jury on that question. That's a, I mean, that's a jury of our peers. These are folks from the community. The community has spoken. This is murder. She's a convicted murderer. Although it might not comport with legal statutes and kind of what we've been taught in law school, you know, we, maybe we got to go back and look at what we're actually uh, um, you know, teaching uh, law students and how we're writing these statutes. Um, you know, Because at the end of the day, a man was murdered in his home in cold blood. No statute should afford, at least coming from this jury, no statute should afford the person who killed that person any possibility of not being charged with murder. Um, somebody asks, uh, how long will the appeals process take? It's hard to say. Um, for example, I'm, I was working on the Crystal Mason appeal out of uh, Tarrant County, the woman who was convicted of voting. Uh, she was convicted five years. And, you know, she got convicted in 20... It was 2017, I believe. Um, here it's 2019. She hadn't even gone back. Well, she, I think she just got back to appellate court a month ago. Um, and so, you know, it, it takes time. You know, these, you know, these appellate courts, they're backlogged with a lot of cases. Um, so it really just boils down to, you know, you know, bureaucracy and red tape and kind of pushing cases through intake process, things of that nature. So you can expect a lengthy amount of time to be, uh, I guess lengthy is relative to, you know, uh, how you do time. but. It's not going to be quick, you know. Um, let's see. People, another person asked, will the jury be sequestered during the punishment phase? Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, obviously, they'll, yes. They, will remind, they will definitely uh, remain sequestered. It seems like that was a good decision on the judge's part to, to do that. It was a good decision. I think that was, wasn't the only decision she had to make, but I don't think that was ever in question. Um, this case here is, I mean, this whole entire city is talking about this case. So to put a jury out and let them go home and you know, speak with their loved ones about this case, it would have been, would have been the wrong decision. Um, right, and they've been, they've been sequestered in a hotel. They've not had access to phone, internet, mm -hmm. TV. Hopefully they got no. a good book. Hopefully, yeah, I hope they like to read. Or reviewing evidence. It would be, it would be uh, difficult, especially in our modern day, to be yeah. Sequestered like that. That's hard. I mean, we're approaching two weeks. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I've been able to leave my phone for two seconds. Um, so, you know, I, I think I, it definitely is testing the will of the jurors, but I think they understand the gravity of this case. And, you know, I would assume that they don't mind having to, well, not having to, but, you know, getting the privilege of being on this jury. So. Um, somebody else asked, do you think that the defense attorneys messed up letting Amber Geiger testify? <sighs> I mean, hindsight is twenty twenty for sure. And I hate to Monday morning quarterback this, but I would say so. I think a lot of times in these officer-involved shooting trials, you know, the defense teams representing these officers just assume that 
due to the fact that their defendant is an officer, they're going to be given the benefit of the doubt. They're going to be found to be believable, that they're going to be sympathetic. But I think the tide is, is really turning in this country. I don't think we're giving officers undue credit when it comes to their credibility. Um, and I think we've seen it here. Um, so in hindsight, looking at how you know the jury ruled on this uh, or the decision that they rendered, I probably wouldn't have put her on the stand. I would have just put the onus on the state and allowed them to you know, have to live up to their burden. But you know, in hindsight, I think uh, I think the defense probably did themselves a disservice. And I and I don't want to I don't want to say it as if that uh, Mr. Shook and Mr. Rogers. But are once bad they attorneys. made that promise, they had to. You made they made the promise and they were married to it. Um, but I think they've seen other trials, you know, the Wiley trial, the Oliver trial, other trials across the country. They've seen other attorneys do this. Um, I'm sure they probably reached out to consultants concerning testimony from their uh, from their client. Um, I'm sure they were well advised on putting her on the stand, but I think this changes the playbook a bit. You know, I don't think you can use kind of these uh, um, these things that we believe to be a given when it comes to officers getting some type of uh, assumption of uh, being credible anymore. So, you know, there's going to be a lot of, uh, there's going to be a change of approach when it comes to trying these cases for uh, defense attorneys. Somebody else asked uh, about the reason for including manslaughter and also was curious what your thoughts on the decision not to include criminally negligent homicide. Uh, well, I didn't. I didn't watch the portion of uh, the jury charges being uh, hashed out between uh, you know, uh, defense and state and the judge, but I would think that uh, maybe Judge Kim didn't want to confuse the jurors. They already had a tough task ahead of them, um, so she wanted to simplify it. Either you think it's manslaughter or you think it's murder. Criminally, criminally negligent homicide, I don't even think we would have gotten to that point anyway, so um, I think it was more so just simplifying the charges for the jury and giving, it, giving their... Uh, give, giving them the opportunity of coming out with a decision. Um, somebody asked, uh, will she have to serve the full sentence? Like, what, what's the rules on, on sentences and how, what she has to serve? Uh, yeah, so it's not, like, it's not like a federal sentence where you've got to serve 85% of your sentence. Uh, you know, there's good time that could be, you know, you know, you know a portion to her, uh, her sentence as she's serving it. Um, so, you know, there's a possibility that she could be eligible for parole. Um, so, yeah, I mean... She gets sentenced to, to 20 years. I don't expect her to be in prison for 20 years. That's if she has good time credits. Um, somebody also asks, um, do, do you think her conviction will help out with civil suits? Uh, so Daryl Washington is somebody that I work with uh, on some of these civil rights cases. And uh, you know we talk about this all the time, uh, me, him, uh, I, and Lee Merritt. And we've talked about convictions actually hurting civil suits. Um, really? Because, Why do you say that? Yeah, so if an officer gets convicted, a lot of times juries say, well, the officer was convicted, so a lot of the damage has been mitigated, right? Or it makes it easier for a city to kind of dis discard the officer because they've been convicted, they've likely been fired, so they've mitigated, you know, having a bad apple amongst the bunch, um, you know. And sometimes I guess, you know, a conviction could aid in the civil suit, but it really just depends. This is the matter of uh, how you interpret a conviction. Some people are just kind of asking what's been going on. I guess they're, they're jumping in late. Uh, Amber Geiger this morning, the verdict came back. The jury found her guilty of murder. And now we are in the punishment phase of this trial. And we've heard testimony from um, Botham Jean's mother, sister, his supervisor, and also from a supervisor of Amber Geiger. And then we've seen text messages of inflammatory, racially charged text messages that she sent, and also um, some stuff on Pinterest that's, that's problematic. Right, right. The state painted Ms. Geiger to be someone who is not a friend of minorities. And that is going to bite her in the butt when it comes to punishment. Um, and I think, and I, I, didn't, I didn't watch the Roy Oliver punishment phase, but he got 15 years for, he got 15, for yeah. murdering uh, Jordan Edwards. Uh, and what happened in, in that case was, was, was horrible. Right. I mean, Roy Oliver uh, fired into that car as yeah. he was fleeing. I mean, it, there was no, the there was zero, teenagers. right, there was zero, zero reason to right. fire into that car. Right. And the, I believe it was body cams. Yeah. Body cams showed it, and, um, and he got 15 years. And right. And of course, Ken Johnson, 
Uh, he was the Farmer's Branch police officer who yeah. uh, some kids had broken into his car um, and he chased them down and, and, and fired at them and one of one of the kids died mm -hmm. and uh, he got 10 years. Right. So, you know, but, but, the, but, the, but the jury can't and won't know about those sentences. Right, and I think they can make a decision that's uh, informed and, um, you know, it's something that appreciates the gravity of the situation without having to go to other cases. Um, and I think we all understand, you know, society as it is now, you know, the issue with police brutality and officers not being held accountable. So I don't think the state needs to even go to that point, although they're not going to be able to present that anyways. And the facts of this case are just so unique and egregious. I think this case on its own, within a vacuum, I think the jury can be uh, uh, tasked with uh, coming with a decision that's free and independent of anything else that's going on uh, in society. Somebody was asking if if they're going to call Rivera. I, I kind of think that's <laughs> unlikely. I don't see Martin Rivera. Well, you want to work stand. against your interest. I mean, Martin Rivera was one of the people that she was texting uh, in those text messages that were that were shown. I think it was about the. Uh, it might have been about the black officers. I think Rivera was talking about working with black officers um, and complaining about them. And uh, Ms. Geiger talked about, um, you know, the work ethic of black officers being something to be de uh, you know, desired for. And if somebody, if y'all wanted to go back and see those uh, text messages, um, you could back up on, you, you could go on WFA, our YouTube page, and you could back up to and you'll see them pop up on the screen. There's text messages that came up, and the prosecutor read them and explained what they meant and what. Um, and you can you can easily go back and and take a look at those on our YouTube page. And there's also the Pinterest. Uh, what was Pinterest? Oh man, I mean, if anything, this has taught us to watch what we not only post and our activity on social media, but also watch what we text. I mean. You might think that you're texting somebody and that'll never get out unless they screenshot it, but when it comes to a situation like this, the state, in a very uh, thorough way, and they did their, uh, their due diligence and they diligently got those text messages, these text messages are coming back to haunt her in a very serious way. It should make people think long and hard about what they send in a text message. Oh my God, yeah, just pick up the phone and call if you got something racist to say, I suppose, um, or anything that could be incriminating. Um, Exactly. Well, it, or any, yeah, any, or anything that might come back to bite you. Come back you. to bite you, right? right. Yeah. Um, if you want to go back and see those, uh, the whole day of our trial coverage will be on WFA.com and on our YouTube page, so you can easily go back and see that if you would like to take a look at at some of that. And if you'd also like to go back and see uh, testimony from Botham Jean's mother, right, and his sister, and. Um, it was, you know, incredibly compelling All right, right. Uh, testimony from very her. Uh, very heartfelt. Uh, you know, she had All right. you, three you're children. A, you're a mom. How I did, am. I have a son. How I, did that I, affect you? It's, it's heartbreaking. I mean, right. there's no, there's no getting around it. I met both of John's mother um, maybe a day or two after this happened. I mm -hmm. covered the. Uh, there was a. They had a. a a prayer. Yeah, it was at his church, him. and and they had a and ever you know, his mother spoke, and other people spoke. It was, it's heartbreaking. I mean, yeah. There's no, there's no getting around it. Uh, he is in his apartment. He's eating a bowl of ice cream, and seconds later, he's right. dead, and he's Do, not armed. Right, doing nothing that would suggest that he should deserve what happened to him. I mean, and from what we've heard, she she spoke glowingly about him. He seemed to be the model son. You know very loving and caring and always willing to you know, provide a helping hand or a kind word to his family members. You know, I, I feel so bad for them and, you know, it's going to be a tough loss. Um, hopefully, and not to cut you off, but hopefully this decision today is helping them in their grieving process. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, nothing, nothing brings back their son. Yeah, but yeah, right. I don't know. I hate using the word closure because it feels so. It's the thing people say. Right. Because I don't think you ever get over the loss of a child. I think you. Because I've 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 known people that have lost children, and you. You never get over it. Maybe right. You just. It's, you learn it's to like, live with it. Yeah, right. it's like yeah, it's hard. Right. I can't. I don't even. I hope I never have to imagine it. Um, we have had a lot of people ask about Martin Rivera and the deletion of those text messages. 
t they keep asking about it, whether it's tampering with evidence. At the time, they would have been deleted. They wouldn't have been evidence, and yeah. they were. Right. I, you can understand why he would delete those text messages, right? Right. Yeah, he wouldn't want his wife to see him. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I doubt, I, it, I doubt it was. Mo it yeah. wasn't criminal intent. Well, I guess cheating on his wife well. could be cr seen criminal by some people. <laughs> Um, exactly. But yeah, I think he was just trying to avoid a situation he would have to explain to his uh, his, his significant other. Um, I guess it could be seen as tampering with evidence. I mean, ultimately, that evidence would have allowed a jury or provided a jury uh, extra context. So yeah, I mean, honestly, I think DPD they need to talk to Mr. Rivera and really do some soul searching about his continued employment there, or if there's some type of private reprimand, they need to uh, you know look into that because he did delete evidence for whatever reason I mean I but guess that's it, arguable. Is it evidence at the time that it happened? I mean right. it's early it's our I mean I'm it's hours earlier right. so. And I mean there's no mens rea involved he didn't act actively de delete criminal evidence to avoid being prosecuted for a crime um, you know yeah we it's interesting this whole this whole situation is just the fact pattern is so unique so many different, you know, issues have popped up and come out of nowhere. Um, but I do believe that, you know, Officer Rivera doesn't have clean hands here, obviously. Um, so, I mean, if we're talking about the entire context of what happened, there are a lot of folks that need to have their actions addressed, whether it, if it's not in a criminal context, it might, it, might, it might need to be in an internal context with DPD or whatever. So, uh, also, you got the civil suit pending, so that could be mentioned in that as well. Yeah. Right. Uh, when it comes to uh, having liability for the city of Dallas. Uh, somebody asked why uh, would she have chosen a jury over a judge for her sentencing? You know, I was talking to a colleague about that also. Um, with the issues and how the law is constituted uh, presently, it seemed as if it would have been appropriate to go to a judge on this issue. But I think she felt that with a, you know, with the, with the large spate of uh, acquittals for officers over the past few years, I think she felt confident going to a jury. Um, so I think that's why she decided to go with the jury in this situation. So we're going to be back on TV here in a second. I'm waiting. Uh, uh, Nick, how far out are we? What'd you say? Two minutes? Ish? Okay. Um, and obviously you're going to cue me since I can't. That's the weird thing is I can because of the way the our earpiece situation is i can hear courtroom stuff but i can't hear studio stuff. beyond the studio stuff so uh, it's like you know flying blind a little bit right so, right um which is why you saw me trying to make sure we got straight what what exactly they were right. going to be asking so i can't since i can't actually hear them um somebody else asked oh oh that's what they're going to say that will actually help a lot okay is we're going to be cynthia asking okay. questions um Somebody wanted to know, um, oh, do you think her parents, do you think we'll hear from Amber Geiger's parents? Yes, yes, yes. That might be, if Geiger testifies first, her mom is probably going to testify right after. I mean, the only people that really know Amber Geiger intimately are her parents. Um, and you know they'll be able to talk about kind of just her life path, kind of like with uh, Mrs. John did for uh, for both of them. So she's gonna lay out you know from start to finish who was Amber, how was who was Amber as a young child, how how did she grow as a young woman, kind of talk about the mistakes that she's might have made throughout throughout life, her propensity for uh, being contrite when she's made those mistakes, talk about how this situation has affected Amber and the whole entire family. Um, so yeah, you should fully expect her to try and get on the stand and and I hate to use the word beg, but she's gonna beg for her daughter's life. She didn't want to see her in prison for the rest of uh, uh, her life, so she's gonna try her best to uh, avoid that. Somebody asked uh, whether Amber will be on suicide watch. I wouldn't know, I don't know about that, but I would think that she'd be in, obviously in protective custody. Yeah, um, you know, I mean, I have a case recently that, that deals with are we about to go? Okay.
No, she cannot get out on an appeal bond. Uh, Justin Moore is a, a local a criminal defense attorney who is joining us to explain why not. So back in 2017, and I think it's important for us to understand this, the law actually changed. So people who have been, who have been convicted of a murder conviction, they cannot be uh, provided the opportunity to get out on an appeal bond because the conviction of murder, murder, that, that crime is so dastardly. So I think the uh, Texas State Legislature has said that we want to be able to protect our folks in the community and not allow these folks who have been convicted of murder the opportunity to continue to reside and uh, present a threat to other community members. What did the rule used to be? Uh, the rule used to be if uh, your conviction was under 10 years or if your sentence or your punishment was under 10 years, then you would have the opportunity to be out on appeal bond. But they changed that in 2017, as I, ju as I just mentioned, and uh, that rule will not provide uh, Ms. Geiger the opportunity to be out on appeal bond. Okay. Thank you. We'll go back to Cynthia. All right. Our thanks to you, Tanya and Justin. Oh, okay. Whew, sorry, that folks out there that are watching us, it's it's uh, kind of like doing double duty yeah. here as we're doing this. Uh, I think they're they're done with us TV wise for the day. Okay. Um, let's see. I think uh, anybody else got any more questions out there that uh, you would like J Justin to answer because we're probably going to wrap it up here pretty soon. So we just give a, I'll just give another quick wrap. Uh, obviously, Amber Geiger found guilty of murder this morning. It was a jury of eight women, uh, four men. They came back with that verdict after uh, deliberating for about six hours, four hours yesterday, two hours today. And now we are in the punishment phase of this trial. We've heard from Botham John's mother. We've heard from his sister. And we've heard from uh, his, his supervisor and others. Mm -hmm. And then we've seen these text messages. Right. Uh, and, and, and there's a reason why they did not want these in guilt right. or innocence. The state has been surgical throughout the entirety of this uh, proceeding from guilt, innocence up until now. They laid out the character of Botham Jean with not only presenting his mother, but his sister, but also his work supervisor who knew both of them from when he was an intern in college up until now. They shown that he was a person who was of great regard, someone who was a, a benefit to the community, a beacon, somebody who was a rising star. And they juxtapose that to those text messages and that social media activity of Amber Geiger. And when you see those in comparison, there's absolutely no way that a jury will find Ms. Geiger sympathetic I don't want to say no way, I don't want to make it an absolute, but it's going to be tough for the defense to kind of use Geiger's image and kind of, uh, you know, find some type of sympathy when it's being compared to someone like Botham John, someone who was uh, you know, a choir leader, someone who uh, was uh, involved in the community, someone who always was lending a helping hand, someone who was thoughtful and, and caring and, um, you know, just a, a young black man who had a future ahead of him and who was mowed down in his apartment eating ice cream, it's going to be hard for the defense to make Ms. Geiger look likable. And we've been talking about this the entirety of the trial. Is she going to be likable enough to get some type of sympathy? If she wasn't likable enough to avoid a murder conviction, is she going to be likable enough to not get a lengthy sentence in prison? We're they going to see. We keep having people who are coming in and out and they some of them have not seen the text messages. If you go on our YouTube page, you can back up uh, to uh, towards the end of that day. You'll see the text messages pop up. You'll see them on the screen. It was text messages. It was Pinterest, and the prosecutor uh, explains those text messages right. and what they were. They, she walks uh, you through it, and so you can easily see that on our WFA YouTube page. Um, another person asked about a civil suit and if this will if this verdict helps at all. It just depends on how you interpret it. It could help from the standpoint of you have a convicted officer, so they're going to be more inclined to want to settle because putting her in front of a jury again in a civil courtroom, you kind of know the playbook, and I don't think her civil attorneys have a lot to kind of work with when it comes from an image standpoint. But also, like we've always talked about, what we just talked about, a lot of times a conviction 
helps the city avoid uh, maintaining liability for that officer or for that fired officer who's a convicted murderer now. So uh, it really just depends. It's going to be a, a tough job for uh, Lee Mayor Daryl Washington and Ben Crump to come up with a compelling argument to uh, keep the city involved in the lawsuit. Uh, but you know they're they are very capable attorneys. They have been around the block a few times, so I think they have their arguments prepared to keep the city locked in, and uh, I fully uh, suspect that uh, they'll be able to advocate for the Johns in their civil suit. Okay, here's an, a question from uh, uh, someone who works in a state lawmaker's office that I know. Unlike federal court where defendants must serve day for day upon conviction, what percentage of Geiger's sentence will she actually have to serve before she is eligible for parole? I believe it's three to one, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. It's not day for day. Uh, like they do in the feds. Um, so I believe it's three for one. It's not 85. You don't have to serve 85% of your sentence. Um, so, you know, with, with good time, possibly if she uh, shows herself to be a model inmate, um, you know, whatever her sentence is, she won't be serving the entirety of it. Um, I'm getting a text message from uh, someone I know in the Dallas Police Department so letting us let me know that if you have an escaped prisoner, it is always a control number. They, they uh, basically, okay. and, I, and that's what I thought. So when, you know, there was testimony from uh, Sergeant Robert Watson, who was her, uh, on, who was our C crime response team supervisor, and a uh, prisoner, a handcuffed prisoner had gotten away and she didn't notice, no, notify our supervisor. So, and he, had, he right. did a request for control number. So um, obviously the department would take any right. time somebody gets I wonder away. why Watson made an issue about uh, her not telling him about it. Well, I guess because because a handcuffed prisoner getting away is kind of a big deal. Right. I mean, that's right. They, they right. don't look kindly upon that. Right. And so I could I could so see why that. So the fact that she tried way. to bury it and. Well, she should have told him. She should have told him. Um, and uh, somebody's asking, um, do all jurors have to agree on punishment? Does that have to be a unanimous decision? Uh, I don't believe so. Um, Somebody wants me to put my text, my phone number out there. I think I'll do that. <laughs> uh, that's um, all right. I see you. Uh, no, I think I'll just keep my, I, I mean, I'm, my phone number is spread pretty far and wide, but I don't know that I want to put it on social mm. media. Um, uh, let's see. Um, if people want to know, uh, will punishment take all day? J Justin, so we've, we've heard from um, his mother, his, his sister, and, and a few, and a couple other folks. Do you think... If you had to ballpark it, when do you think they right. we go to the closing statements, so to speak, and then we go to the deliberation? So if the state did rest with presenting their evidence today. Which know, sure looks like it. It took them half a day, so I could see the defense taking either half a day or, or, or a full day. It's not going to take as long as good or innocence. Um, so we could see a, a punishment decision tomorrow, or we could see one Thursday. Okay. Yeah. How long do you think the, the so the jury deliberated six hours this time? Any thoughts on how long they'll deliberate and what what will go uh, into that decision making? So I mean, with guilt or innocence, um, my theory has always been for every day of testimony, you can a lot for an hour of uh, jury deliberation. So it was six days of testimony and it equaled six hours of deliberation. Uh, with punishment, I think it'll be a a, a lot quicker. I would. I would presume um, it's not going to be a lot of evidence for them to consider. So it's going to be all character evidence, whether it's mitigating or aggravating uh, uh, factors from uh, Miss Geiger's past or character, things of that nature. So I could presume that it's going to be a rather quick decision from the jury. Um, I don't think they're going to labor through this uh, longer than you know, maybe a couple of hours. Okay. You think they've already got an idea what they want to do? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like you know, like I said, it was rumored that uh, you know at least half of the jurors um, had their minds made up before the trial started. So um, I think you know once they made the conviction, now, if that were true, that would be part of an appeal. Yeah, that, that's why it's rumors, and you know, um, but you you know a lot of times it's always funny um, when you talk to jurors after the fact. Some of them will be candid with you and tell you like I thought this person was guilty before I even sat down and heard any evidence. Um, so it wouldn't be too outrageous if that were the case, especially with a case or a trial that has uh, been highly, highly publicized for a year, such as this one. Uh, somebody's asking if the prosecution can call up Martin Rivera. I mean, they could, but I, it's just hard to believe that they would. 
Yeah, right? it's I mean, it's like the jury's already heard that. You got the you got you got text you got a text message exchange talking about um, you know Amber Geiger's black colleagues. I mean, that's damning within itself. I mean, you can pile on and have them up there and humiliate them any, any further, but I, mean, I think that would have been pointless. Uh, so somebody asked, how many years does a murder charge carry? It's five to ninety-nine. Five to ninety-nine. And there is no possibility of no of no possibility of probation. But we talked about the caveat, um, you know. So it just feels unlikely. Yeah, but given, you, I, I mean, think if they wanted to give second degree. Well, explain it to folks here, in right, case people I'll, have joined us late. I'll read the statute once again. So. At the punishment stage of a trial, the defendant may raise the issue as to whether he or she caused the death under the immediate influence of a sudden passion arising from an adequate cause. If the defendant proves the issue in the affirmative by a preponderance of the evidence, the offense is a felony in the second degree. So, I mean, we talked about, you know, the jury obviously made the determination that this is first degree murder. They had the opportunity of, you know, charging or convicting Ms. Uh, Geiger of manslaughter, which would have been second degree, but they obviously wanted that first degree murder charge. But if the defense is able to raise this argument and effectively uh, convey this to the jury, and the jury considers it, long shot, but they could possibly ask for a second degree uh, uh, felony charge here, or conviction here, which would give uh, Ms. Amber Geiger uh, the ability to uh, uh, ask for probation. We think it's a long shot. I think you and I agree on that. I, mean, I, I think if the jury wanted to go with a second degree felony, they would have gone with manslaughter. They would have done that. I mean, not that they, they don't know about that provision in the law, but right. it just seems unlikely. Right. And I mean, it, if she were able to, you know, enter punishment with nothing but great testimony that shows how sympathetic of a person she was, the jury could have split the baby on this and said, well, we're going to convict you of murder so you can be a convicted murderer for the rest of your life, but we're not going to have you in prison for a long time or we're gonna give you the opportunity of having probation. But the fact that with these text messages and how, I wouldn't just say likable both of John was, but how lovable he was, I don't see them um, splitting the baby on this one. So I'm told that court will start in conferences at 8.30 a.m. tomorrow. Testimony should re resume at 9.30 conferences, is that something where, you, where we'll hear sound or is that something that, that sounds like that would be something where we'll just see people in court? Well, we might hear sound. So we heard sound today. It was, uh, I think when it was the, conferences before. When they were, are, when they were, there's this discussion about whether or not the text messages yeah. were going to get in and some of that stuff. Right. So, yeah, right. So just housekeeping issues. We might hear sound. I, I hope so. A lot of the stuff, a lot of the minutia that they've been arguing about has been really compelling. and riveting. Well, cause it, because then you see where they're headed. Right. You know, with the text messages, you could see why right. the prosecution wanted to get it in and why the defense did not right. want it brought in. And a lot of times, that's where the real legal battle is. It, it lies on the margins outside of the presence of the jury. Because you get into the arguments of, is this relevant or not? Can this expert testify to this? Can these text messages get in? I mean, the fact that we didn't get the expert testimony of uh, Armstrong and Craig Miller I think that really killed the defense's case there. I mean, they wanted to present those guys and they wanted them to say what Ms. I Ms. Geiger's actions were reasonable that night. If they were, if they would have been able to do that, I think we would have seen a far different uh, outcome. At least that's my, uh, that's my opinion there. But, you know, back to my point, that's where the real legal fights are. And hopefully we get audio tomorrow because I want to hear what's going on in that courtroom. Um, I want to hear, kind of like you said, what direction the state wants to go in and what direction the defense wants to go in. Hey, Nick, somebody's asking why the live feed was, feed was cut off on Facebook. Is it, I mean, not, not Facebook, YouTube. Is it still up? Are they still able to, to see us? It's still going? Okay. Uh, the, the court is over for the day, so, you, you know, you're just watching us chit-chat here and try to answer just folks' uh, questions. Um, somebody, I did see a question uh, from someone who was asking about whether or not Amber Geiger had been taken into custody. Uh, the answer is yes. She was handcuffed by uh, Pete Schulte, who's a local, not handcuffed by Pete, but, <laughs> but Pete t tweeted out that she had been handcuffed and taken into custody by Dallas County Sheriff's deputies right. and that the judge had cleared the courtroom so that the media did not get uh, right. video of that. But she will be taken to the Lou Starrett uh, Justice Center and she will be booked into the Dallas County Jail. And 
Dallas County's practices, they do release booking video. So we should, I assume, we'll either, tonight. either tonight or tomorrow. I mean, the, the one thing about Dallas County is, at least in terms of the jail, they're pretty quick on uh, releasing that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, somebody asked about David Armstrong and what we thought about um, what he had to say and the judge's decision. And of course, T David Armstrong was the Texas Ranger who um, said he didn't think she committed a crime. Obviously, the, I mean, the jury didn't hear that, but they right. certainly thought differently. Right. I mean, his, his, his testimony was, it was quite remarkable. I mean, he was the person, he was the reason why we got a warrant for her arrest, uh, Geiger's arrest. I mean, he's the lead investigator and he's turning back on a dime and saying that what she did was not, uh, was not criminal. Um, so, I mean, honestly, his testimony, I didn't really take it. Um, I didn't really take it that seriously. I took it with a grain of salt because typically when you see officers testify in these types of trials for other officers, they typically always say that, you know, the officer on trial, that their actions were reasonable. Um, so I wasn't really too shocked by that. I mean, it might have been shocking for a jury to hear, uh, which is why the state fought hard to keep that testimo testimony out. Um, but I do, I do believe if this testimony would have gotten in, we would have seen um, a different outcome. Uh, so uh, I think his testimony is uh, something that should be remembered. Uh, when he testified to it being reasonable, I think everybody had, had a, you know, a healthy uh, amount of shock in response to it. Um, but, you know, and like we said earlier, that could be an appealable issue, the fact that, you know, the, the defense wasn't able to present that testimony. Um, but, you know, typical of an officer to go up there, and I don't want to say typical of an officer, but... Let me say, because I, I don't think I've right. ever heard an officer who got a warrant say right. something like that. Right, yeah, I don't want to say that, but as far as, you know, I guess testifying to the reasonable, reasonableness of her actions, I wasn't really shocked by uh, that being his testimony. Oh, um, somebody's asking is whether or not other cops will get in trouble because of the text messages. I, I mean, it's, that's really hard to say. That's I mean, internal I, I stuff. Don't, I don't know that we can yeah. safely address that. That's going to be up to the department to determine yeah. how to address um, yeah. those issues. Uh, someone that people are talking about. Okay, so somebody asked, is the prosecution, uh, is, their pro is their testimony over? We really couldn't tell. It looks I think so. like it might have been. I think so. I can see Judge saying, all right, you guys are finished for today and we're going to allow defense to start in the morning because I, I think they stopped around 3.30ish maybe? 4ish? Um, I don't know. It all, it all starts to run together right now. Yeah. I mean, if defense was, if they were still presenting evidence, I'm sure she would have gone until 5 maybe. Um, yeah, it, yeah, it kind of feels like she would have wrapped them up. Yeah. And so, because the way they, they kind of... Uh, Somebody's asking me if Amber Geiger's dad is a judge in Kaufman County. Oh. Not that I'm aware of, right. but I, I mean, that was some rumor. I don't, I don't, I'm not aware of that. Right. Uh, there's, Kaufman County doesn't have that many judges. They only have two district judges and one or two county court at law yeah. judges. So I don't, yeah. I don't, there's none that I'm aware of with the last name Geiger. So, right. um, would you expect more than one of her uh, family members to testify? Uh, mom for sure. I don't know if she has any siblings. Um, I would say. I think uh, she does, but I feel like she testified she had one or two. Right. Well, you know, both of them had his mother and his sister testify. So I can see, you know, the defense trying to mimic that or, you know, she needs, she needs everybody who's willing to say a good word about her to take the stand tomorrow. So, um, if it's family, friends, somebody that you know she knew from the grocery store growing up that liked her, they need to get up there and testify to her being a, a good person because what the jury has now, they have nothing that's redeemable for Ms. Geiger. Um, and you know the defense, they're gonna have to find somebody or find a way to kind of mitigate that. Uh, somebody was asking if Amber Geiger gets a death penalty. Uh, no. Obviously not. Can not you kind of explain the, because folks right. may not know the difference between capital, capital murder, murder and murder. So capital murder provides uh, a death penalty, um, uh, I guess, enhancement, so to speak. So she's not eligible for the death penalty, nor is she eligible for life without parole. 
because this wasn't a capital murder. It's just a, it's just a first degree murder. So that's why her, uh, her sentence range is from five to 99 years. So she won't be facing the death penalty. And she might be, I mean, she's facing 99 years, which is almost a virtual uh, life sentence. Um, she, she could be sentenced to die in prison, but um, she's not gonna be seeing uh, death row. And again, somebody's asking if she'll be in a jail jumpsuit tomorrow. That That's pretty unlikely. In, in, no, she in, won't. In cases, you, you want the juries you don't want them to be affected by somebody right. being in a jail jumpsuit. She'll be, she would be extremely prejudiced by that if she was in a jail jumpsuit and handcuffs. She might be in leg restraints. I can pretty, uh, pretty much guarantee that. Well, I don't want to guarantee it, but I think there's a likelihood that she might be in leg restraints tomorrow. Okay. Well, we're going to wrap it up. I feel like we've answered uh, all the questions. Yeah, my um, coffee's wearing off. <laughs> no, I'm with you. I'm getting tired. Uh, all right, well, just to recap real quick, Amber Geiger found guilty of capital murder this morning. We heard from, uh, in, in the, as the punishment phase of this trial has started, his, we've heard from his mother, his sister, uh, his supervisor, and then we've, of course, seen some pretty uh, explosive text messages uh, with, that Amber Geiger wrote and that are among, with her and other officers, and as well as some stuff from Pinterest. Uh, we're expecting uh, the trial will, the punishment phase of this trial will resume tomorrow with conferences at 8.30 a.m., with testimony at 9.30 a.m., and we'll be waiting to see if Amber Geiger takes the stand again and who we may hear from uh, in her family. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us, and I appreciate all your questions.